My name is John Lash, and I am responsible for bringing the fallen goddess scenario to the world. Solely responsible. I welcome your interest in the home story, which describes the origin of the earth and humanity in a way that cannot be found in any other mythic narrative. Of course, there is no way for me to know the source of your interest, or the depth of it, for that matter. It may be mere curiosity that brings you here. You may have a deeper longing for something that you can't define. Or you may be driven by a deeper passion to discover something that gives greater meaning to your life. Whatever the case, I can assure you that you will find here something unique and original. And whether or not it complements your reality and enriches and enhances you on your path in life, well, that is for you to determine. In this brief introductory message, I'd like to make two simple points regarding the home story. In my view, there are two things I can say at the outset that will be helpful for your orientation. First, I'll repeat something that I've said elsewhere in my talks over the past 20 years. The transpersonal fulfills the personal. The personal cannot fulfill itself. That proposition does not mean that the personal is in any way inferior to the transpersonal. It does not mean that you cannot fulfill your life without knowing about the fallen goddess scenario. Certainly you can if you choose to do so. But additional to your personal fulfillment, there is another dimension of life that comes to you uniquely through engagement with this story. Many people in the world, I find, through my years of teaching and conversation, are longing for a transpersonal purpose even though they may not be able to define or express what that means. That being so, I find as a teacher that people benefit from being shown the way to that transpersonal perspective. And that is exactly what this myth does. Second point concerns commitment. You will notice if you subscribe to the nine episodes that the narrative begins in short paragraphs and it gets longer and longer as the episodes unfold. So reading the first, second or third episode just in itself, apart from the terms defined and the commentary is pretty easy and only takes a few minutes. But as you proceed deeper into the narrative, it requires more time and concentration. And some of the closing episodes are rather long and quite complex. The point I'm making here is that if you truly want to learn this story, it will require some time, it will require a commitment of your attention over time. Those who have come to know and love this story all tell me that they have read these episodes and reflected on them many times. So there is a commitment involved here. There is a responsibility 
that comes with learning the story, which is truly the biography of the living earth. But if you choose to make that commitment, you won't be alone. I invite you to join Nemata, either as a visitor or a supporting member. And there you will find a growing number of people around the world who are dedicated to learning and teaching this unique mythic narrative. And it gets better. In Planetary Tantra, there is a set of practices for participating in this myth as a living adventure, as an experiment of interaction with the planet, your Divine Mother. As the introductory video explains, the Sophianic myth is like a film that is being written while it is being shot. So you, if you choose to be an actor in that film, become an agent in the screenwriting process. You contribute to an open-ended myth and you play a role in the direction of the story as well as its outcome. Bear in mind that I am not the author of the Fallen Goddess scenario. It comes from ancient sources and it comes back to the world after 2,000 years of suppression. Everyone who participates in the myth in its current and ongoing form has the role of an author and actor in how it plays out. No other myth in the world presents an opportunity like that. So, finally, in closing, I want to address a question that certainly comes to mind to everyone who encounters this myth. How come the entire myth in nine episodes presents a story of events that happen even before the human races appear on the earth? After all, if the home story is really your story as well, then you would expect it, of course, to present some kind of scenario of human evolution. Well, it does so, but it does so in the further iterations of the narrative. What you have here is FGS 1.0, but currently to this moment today, the narrative has evolved to FGS 7.7. .7. And so there is quite a follow-up. However, the first part of the story is only about Sophia, how she designed the human genome, how she came to turn into the earth, and the many difficulties and challenges that she encountered in the course of her own experiences. Now, why would you want to learn about that, which may in certain respects seem to be remote or even abstract? Well, I leave you with this proposition. Suppose that you were an orphan and you didn't know who your parents were. You didn't know where you were born, what culture and race your ancestors came from. And suppose you had an opportunity to learn all that. Would you be interested? Or would you be content to be a rootless orphan knowing nothing about your origins. The drama, the cosmic galactic drama of the Aeon Sophia describes your origins and tells you who are your divine parents. 
I will close on that note and extend my best wishes to all those who enter upon this sublime and unique adventure. Across the world, in all times and places, humans have relied on stories to explain the source of life, how the earth and humanity came to be, and the purpose of being here. Such stories, called myths, are not all mere fantasies, products of ignorance and superstition. Some can be proven to be true and verified by experience. A genuine myth is no fantasy. It is correct and accurate. It teaches how to live. It supports good morals, sanity and responsibility. Ultimately, the true myth is like a compass, guiding the way to live in freedom and share the power and beauty of that mystery called life. But what myth satisfies these terms, the complete transcendent story of life that can explain its origin and purpose? In the world today, three belief systems direct and dominate the lives of billions. The great world religions, as they are called, prevail in the West, Europe, America and all over the earth. Even though those systems originate in a remote desert land, like an imported product that cannot be homegrown, and the Far East offers other systems, alternative myths that influence and even captivate Western people. Why don't white Western nations have their own myth, rather than a version imported from an alien land? Where is their homegrown version of a transcendent life story rooted in an indigenous history, race and culture? The truth is, it exists, but that specific myth has been repressed and withheld from common knowledge. It has been attacked and slandered more than any other topic ever known in all of history. It is a unique vision story set on the galactic scale, describing the origin of the earth and the human races and inspiring love for the bountiful web that unites all living creatures, all species. This is the myth of the wisdom goddess Sophia, she who is Mother Earth, embodied in the planet itself. The true creation story on Earth points to the planet as the divine source, immediate and obvious. Unlike religion, Sophianic myth does not designate a creator god beyond the realm of senses. Rather, it presents the living presence of the Divine Mother in a description that you can live and explore, as if you were a character acting in a movie with freedom to influence how the story turns out. It is often said, life is but a dream, but this begs the question, who is the dreamer? Sophianic myth reveals how the wisdom goddess dreams a world where you live as her biological child and also as a conscious actor who influences what she dreams. Participation in the dreaming power of the earth is the supreme practice to be learned, enjoyed and tested when you bring your heart and mind to the sacred narrative of Sophia the Fallen Goddess Scenario. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in nine episodes. 
Episode 1, Once Upon a Tremor At the hidden heart of the universe, matrix of all possible worlds, a mysterious tremor arises. This is an ecstatic pulsation released by the originator, the all-beholding one. Without form, content or definition, an echo of perfect emptiness. But being so, it carries the possibility of novelty. Acting like a trigger, the tremor broadcasts the signal for a singularity to emerge at the centre of a galaxy, a pleroma. The cosmic gods who receive the signal are the aeons. The originator is pitch black but reflective, like a boundless plane of obsidian glass. Expansion The originator is the foundation of the open field of the universe resting in a state of perfect stillness and serenity. It does not act, yet it provides the ground for all action, all activity that can arise in countless worlds. It exceeds description except to say that it is a condition of pure, ecstatic beholding. This being so, the originator needs, and even craves, something to behold, an event or display. Otherwise, it remains in inert self-knowing with no relation to anything else in the universe, so there is nothing to behold. The originator not only provides the background for worlds to arise, but also the occasion for those worlds. The tremor of the singularity is just that, an occasion for something to happen that has yet to happen. It carries no plan of action, no foreseen schema or agenda. Even the originator does not know what will become of it. The singularity is an offering of perfect freedom, but to whom is it offered? The originator dwells in the eternal now, where past, present and future are at unity. Limited linear time appears to happen due to the mysterious tremors it releases, which come to manifest in actual events in the activity of countless worlds. This activity never began and never ends. But the perfect condition of eternity belongs uniquely to the originator. So it happens that many worlds arise and dissolve for the pleasure of the all-beholding one. The activity of the universe is emergent, perpetually arising, resting, dissolving, without a first moment or a conclusion although beginnings and endings appear to occur. In this continuum, called eternity, the supporting presence of the originator never varies for a moment. It is all present, but hidden. It does not reveal itself directly, but through what arises from it. It does not impose itself or predetermine anything. Nevertheless, the originator imbues the cosmic display it beholds with its own inherent properties, stillness, bliss, and beauty. That being so, what may be called laws of beauty operate universally in cosmic manifestation. On the large scale, spiral galaxies present an exquisite display of beauty appearing in countless numbers. These vast floating islands of stars provide the locale for organic worlds where the laws of beauty come to expression. In these worlds, living creatures find a suitable habitat, a home. Planetary worlds scattered through the spiraling arms of galaxies are the environments where the vast display of life can unfold. Conditions at the centers of these galaxies are different, however. The hub of each spiral galaxy is the pleroma, fullness, plenitude. Particular forms of organic life do not live there, although the core material is fully and totally alive in its own way. There are countless pleromas manifesting in lenticular spirals, 
Irregular shaped or ragged galaxies also exist, but do not play the same role in cosmic life. The divine creative powers inhabiting the Pleromas are the aeons, or generators. The singularity is a pre-creative surge that only goes active when they detect and capture it. Each galactic vortex is a matrix where actual, manifest worlds can be projected and species to inhabit those worlds can be designed. That is the activity of the aeons. Since the originator does not act and does not create anything, the role of developing singularities into manifest material events falls to the generators. Summary Unlike the following episodes of the FGS, this one has no definable setting, no specific locale. It opens with the concept of the full dimension of the universe outside time and space. Out of eternity, the originator releases a signal tremor. However, this episode does allude to the exact cosmic setting of the FGS, the local spiral or Milky Way galaxy, as it is called. Thus, once upon a tremor, the all-beholding one broadcasts a signal that comes to be detected and captured in a particular galaxy, the one where humans on Earth are living. The specificity of the Gnostic vision story of Sophia is clear and exact. The FGS is an astronomical myth. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 2 The Aeon's Delight In the core of the Milky Way galaxy, two aeons detect the incoming singularity as if catching a note of music trembling in the air. The pulsation instantly incites them to action. Unlike the originator, which is neuter, neither male nor female, aeons are gendered. The male of this couple is Thelite, the female, Sophia. The aeons are living serpentine torrents of divine force able to generate world systems of many varieties. The aeons delight in capturing the singularities released by the originator and shape them into expression. This activity is a ritual of dance, a display of divine play, Leela. Additional to producing material worlds, including stars and planets, the aeons excel in designing templates of animate life, genomes. Sophia and Thelite receive the singularity and spin it into the design of a species, the Anthropos. They instill attributes and properties in the open, undefined pulsation. To so do, they calibrate a basic genomic plan that will eventually emerge as the seed of the human species. Expansion Two divinities among the community of Aeons in the Pleroma detect the singularity capture it, and hold it preciously in their field of attention. These aeons are Thelite, intentional, and Sophia, wisdom. They are living, intelligent, self-aware, cosmic creative powers who delight in giving expression to the singularities emanating from the originator, who remains unexpressive, immersed in pure, inactive beholding. The aeons are generators. The ecstatic ritual dance of Thelite and Sophia generates a field of currents, a whirlpool in the luminous living substance of the Pleroma. This substance is Akasha, plasma. They drive the currents through countless permutations as if churning butter. The fluid patterns of beauty and elegance so created please the aeonic couple. As their pleasure heightens, the patterns cohere into a fixed display that resembles undersea coral, but soft and porous. This display is the calibration of the Anthropos, their designer species. It is a set of unique properties encoded in a chemical base of noose, nucleic acid. 
Once configured in this way, the Anthropos genome is ready for projection into the galactic arms where planetary systems can provide it with an environment in which to seed, emerge, and thrive. The generators themselves do not have a form that resembles humans or other animals in any way. They do not resemble angels with wings or monstrous figures of fantasy, such as those featured in video games and CGI films. No Gnostic writings that survive indicate how they look, even by hints. However, various ancient myths, from China, for example, abound with images of sky dragons. Indian myth describes supernatural powers in the form of Nagas, enormous serpents. Such primordial images approach the description of aeons considered as what they physically are, plasmic torrents. Plasma is an attenuated state of matter that can be compared to an electrified vapour. Aeons may be imagined as inconceivably massive torrents of plasma, now known to be the basic medium of energy pervading the cosmos. In Vedic teachings, plasma is called akasha. The aurora borealis, or northern lights, is a tinted display of rippling currents of plasmic radiation. The paroma, or galactic core, is a vortex of such currents, predominantly white, but fluctuating with coloured hues that correspond to states of emotion and excitement felt by the generators. There is never a single aeon in a galactic core. Plasmic fields are polarised, composed of two distinct interacting forces. Likewise, aeons are gendered, their sexuality consisting of binary flux. The female aeons may be called devs, and the male, zuras. These cosmic creative powers are fully alive, capable of intention, feeling and perception, and able to communicate with each other through sound and light signals. The binary or dyadic energies have the functions of core and sheath. The zuras provide the driving core currents, the devs provide the sheathing currents that surround them. Their magnitude far exceeds the scale of our solar system. Both core and sheath shiver in continuous pulsations of plasmic discharge, interplay, expansion and contraction. The aeons writhe and dance like mating serpents, but they also have resting states. Their substance is a perpetual flux of living luminosity, akasha. Gnostics identified the human genome as anthropos, or the anthropos template. It is the blueprint of the human species. It is the product of the activity of two generators, thelate, intentional, and Sophia, wisdom. They are the divine parents of the human species, but more accurately, our cosmic designers. They are comparable to artists and scientists who set up an experiment rather than parents who conceive a child by sexual intercourse. Yet the aeons do have their own equivalent to intercourse. By energetic mating, they generate a twin coil exactly as mating snakes do. Astronomical photography has captured forms resembling the double helix of DNA. The substratum of DNA, nucleic acid, exists in space on the galactic scale, not merely in our terrestrial habitat. In a dance of delight, Sophia and Thelite shape the singularity in a way that pleases them. Their creative bliss erupts in dewdrops, love sweat of the gods. The dew points streaming from their bodies gather into a standing field that resembles a coral lattice. Due to its retentive properties, this lattice can be encoded with specific traits, qualities, skills of intelligence and volition, so that it condenses into a genomic template, the plan for a species. In this way, the coupled aeons configure the template of an entity, a species yet to be, the Anthropos. 
The material basis of the genomic template designed in the Paroma is exactly as it appears in nature on Earth. It is a chemical substrate, nucleic acid. The properties of the anthropic template conceived by Sophia and Thelate are finite and precise. The acid-based genomic schema has seven circuits plus one balancing and integrating circuit, Sattva. This composite is the calibration of the Anthropos. It is the cosmic source of the human potential that comes to expression when the anthropine species emerges in a favorable habitat. The origin and basis of natural life is galactic life, the plasma fields of supernatural vitality of the generators. Recent advances in astrophysics, mainly found in the heretical paradigm of electric universe plasma cosmology, assert that the external cosmos is thriving with life. There is water in galactic space, some of it collected in nebulae, immense stellar clouds. Nucleic acid, the substrate and transmitting medium of the genetic code, exists in outer space, generated from the living plasma of galactic cores. The Paromas are wellsprings of superlife, supernatural vitality. Only superlife can give birth to natural life. Summary Episode 2 describes in detail how the created dance of the Aeons, Devs and Zuras fashions the template of a living species. The entire community of the Aeons in the Pleroma witness this event, although only two Aeons undertake it. Everything in the cosmos is material, substantial. The galactic core is a plasma vortex consisting of luminous substance with the consistency of liquid pearl. It is deeply radiant but soft, textured like marshmallow. Basically white, it assumes subtle hues depending on the excitation of the aeons. It literally blushes with the emotions of the gods and goddesses at play. In the natural world on Earth, abalone shell, mother of pearl, displays coloration and subtle radiance that closely resembles the colouring of the Pleroma. The description of events in the galactic core drawn from Gnostic writings proves that those ancient seers had the capacity to perceive on the macrocosmic level. In the yoga schools of Vedic India, such occult powers are called siddhis, literally attainments. One example that proves siddhis are real can be found in the Autobiography of a Yogi, 1945, by Paramahansa Yogananda. In Chapter 14, he describes his attainment of blissful cosmic consciousness, Samadhi, extending into direct vision of spiraling galaxies. Yogananda's cosmic illumination belongs to a category of mystical states often defined as self-realization, God-consciousness, cosmic unity, and many other terms. However, the characterization of such states of paranormal awareness usually excludes the capacity for perception on the cosmic scale. Rather, it emphasizes union with God or unity of God and self in an abstract way, suggesting that it is a disembodied condition, out of the body, immaterial, and without content. Close study of the ancient Vedic yoga tradition shows, however, that Samadhi has two forms, with content and without content. Samadhi with content involves a full spectrum of visionary experiences that can engage all the natural senses, hearing, touch, smell, even taste, as well as sight. Gnosis is a yoga-like technique for direct experience of the entire cosmos through the natural faculties. The trained mystics who left the Gnostic writings on the activity of aeons in the Pleroma actually witnessed that activity in altered states. For instance, passages in the Nag Hammadi books assert that the Pleroma has a fragrance. In December 2015, 
Astrophysicists announced the unlikely discovery by the IRAM radio telescope that Sagittarius B2, the gas cloud at the heart of the Milky Way, is saturated with the same chemicals that give fruit, wine, and flowers their distinctive scent and raspberries their delicious flavor. They concluded that the galactic core smells like rum because it's made from ethanol mixed with another acid. The Magian Gnostics who founded the mystery schools were accomplished seers on a par with Vedic masters, but they had more in common with native shamans from the many cultures of Aryan peoples. The genuine shaman can use the normal senses to access the supernatural. Breakthrough research by the proponents of Electric Universe Plasma Cosmology, Thunderbolts Project, provides solid evidence of the activity of Birkeland currents throughout the universe. Composed of plasma, these currents exhibit a dyadic structure of fluid cylinders with a core current and an encasing that rotate against each other. This is exactly the action of aeonic polarity of Devs and Zuras, like Sophia and Thelite. EU cosmology presents a stunning complement to Gnostic cosmology, even though EU scientists have not yet come to the point of admitting that plasma can be alive, sentient, intentionally, emotively active, and intelligent in ways similar to animals on Earth but of course, on a vastly larger scale. The description of pleuromic activity in episode two and elsewhere in the FGS is the result of genuine mystical skills. The proof that visionary powers are no fantasy comes in the evidence of what the founding Gnostics saw and felt, the description they left for the world. Further proof comes from such confirmation as cited here. Confirmation that is ample and growing. Gnosis is a noetic science, but also a shamanic practice. The results of mystical exploration of nature and the cosmos at large depend on executing that practice in the correct way. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 3, Protection and Projection all the aeons in the Paroma observe closely how Sophia and Thelite generate the human genome, the Anthropos. Their participation is ecstatic, like the swell of a chorus engaged in a song of celebration. In sweeping movements, they encircle the mating aeons. Their excitement erupts in momentous bursts of sound, immense acoustic waves. The entire company of aeons dance and sing to celebrate this achievement. They unite around the template and cradle it in a protective lattice. To complete its protection, another aeon, Christos, anointing, saturates the genomic template with a plasmic gel that acts as a sealant. The genome requires the special properties of gemation, so that when it develops into an organism, it will have the cellular resilience to maintain its vital boundaries. The anointing action of the Aeon Christos also endows the species genome with the capacity to live in harmony with other life forms. It instills the key attribute of symbiosis. Now the anthropic template is ready for projection. Acting as one united body, the aeons project it outward beyond the limits of the galactic core. Using a directional ray, they open a needle-like channel on the border of the pleroma. From there, they release it into the galactic limbs, where it can emerge in planetary worlds. The pleroma is the realm of infinite possibility, the core domain. Beyond it in the galactic arms is the kenoma, the realm of finite possibility. Countless stars, nebulae, globular clusters, and planetary systems fill the vast reaches of the spiraling arms. Among these planetary systems, some will provide a favorable habitat for the Anthropos. The projected template resembles a gelatinous clump like frog spawn. It streams across galactic space, 
toward the third arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Then it drifts down into a molecular cloud, the Orion Nebula, M42. There it settles and expands into a vast suspension of nucleic mist, like a pattern of dew on a spider's web. Expansion. The number of aeons in the core of our local galaxy is uncertain, variously estimated as 12, 30, or 36 in Gnostic writings. The action undertaken by two of them, Sophia and Thelite, is supported by all the others. The design and calibration of the Anthropos unfolds in an immense scale beyond human conception. Sonic and luminal activity in the core is a vast orchestration of torrential forces, the song and dance of the cosmic gods and goddesses. Aeons have different powers and ages. The older, more mature aeons are the elders in the Pleromic community. They have performed countless experiments in world-making and species generation. They know that a new species to be launched into the galactic arms requires a protective shield, a lattice comparable to the husk of a seed. A biological plasm encased in such a husk is called a propagule. According to the widely accepted theory of astronomical biology, direct panspermia, outer space is densely seeded with such propagules. The seeds of life originating in a pleroma float through space in a sealed condition until the moment they fall on fertile soil, the welcoming environment of a life-friendly planet. Such is the future to be expected for the anthropic genome. Gnostics named the aeons according to their outstanding attributes, marking traits, or their perceived functions. The marking traits of Sophia and Thelite are wisdom and intention. Thus, the human species is the child of those divine cosmic attributes. The Aeon Christos is so-called due to its unique function, anointing, saturation. The act of anointing is something precise, like distillation in a chemical process or like photosynthesis. It is a miracle of supernature, but completely material, like any process in nature. Anointing, or gemation, is a process that belongs equally to natural life and divine superlife. It ensures that an organism formed of cells will be able to maintain its cellular boundaries, to hold to its skin. In a second effect, it instills the entire organism with the instinct for symbiosis so that it can establish bonds with other organisms. Bounding and bonding summarize the designing power of the Aeon Christos. The Pleroma has a distinct boundary called Storos or Horos, horizon. It compares to the boundary of the yellow yolk of an egg. In cosmic terms, the Pleroma is a yoke with strong bounding properties seen in the core formation of spiral galaxies. The boundary of the galactic core is firm but porous, like the egg yolk. To project a new species for propagation, the aeons deploy a directional ray through the Pleromic boundary. It opens a temporary channel for the genomic template to pass outwards. This needle-like device is a temporary structure that melts away like an icicle when it has served its purpose. It releases the genomic seed into the womb of galactic space outside the pleroma, in the way a sperm cell can be injected into an ova using a pipette for artificial insemination. The pleroma is the domain of infinite possibility, but there is also a domain of finite possibility, the Kenoma, the galactic arms. Those massive structures are filled with material bodies at many different stages of development, young suns, old suns, transient comets, nebula clouds and veils, planetary systems of diverse types and ages. The Kenoma contains all the material effects of experiments conducted over immeasurable time 
by the generators at the galactic core. It also contains vast fields of debris, dust and ash, left over from previous worlds. This disintegrated residue is the raw material for new planets to be formed. Only planets can provide the habitat for life forms designed to appear as minute microbial bodies and large animal creatures of many species, including reptiles, birds, insects and fish. Animal creatures with a head for concentrating, intelligence and limbs for mobility must have a specific kind of home base, an Earth-like planet. Unique atmospheric conditions must prevail, and of course, they require water. In the Kenema, countless Earth-like planets arise and dissolve continually, like bubbles in a soapy solution. When propagules from a genomic template drift into the atmosphere of such worlds, organisms emerge. The nebula M42 in the constellation of Orion is visible to the naked eye. In fact, Orion the Hunter is probably the most easily recognized of all constellations due to the alignment of the three stars in the belt of the male figure it represents. To the left and down from the first star is a blotch, traditionally taken to depict the sword on Orion's belt. That blotch is M42, the Orion Nebula. It covers an immense area, much larger than the dimensions of the solar system. At the heart of the nebula is a distinct formation of four stars, the trapezium, which can be seen with high-powered binoculars. Spread across the immense reaches of the trapezium is the living substance of the anthropic genome, like dew on a spider's web. The four composite stars of the trapezium provide a structure like a loom where the genomic substance collects and dwells. From the trapezium, plasmic streams that flow continually through outer space carry the propagules of the anthropos into galactic regions where they can eventually reach the planetary system suited to them. Summary in episode 3, it becomes apparent that some details of pleromic activity reported by the Gnostic seers are not to be dismissed as far-fetched fantasies or mystical illusions without evidential basis. On the contrary, the meticulous description of these activities coming from the Gnostics reveals how they were able to detect the equivalent to biological processes occurring at the galactic level. To them, nature on Earth and supernature beyond Earth formed a continuum. And in that continuum, everything is alive, animated. Life can only be born from life, not from the non-living or inorganic. There is a place for the inorganic in Gnostic cosmology, as to be seen in upcoming episodes. Among the many beauties of the fallen goddess scenario, it is a narrative that points human attention directly to human origins. To those who learn the narrative, it comes as a shock of total awe to know that you can actually look into the night sky and see where our species originates. The locale is there in M42, the nebula in Orion the Hunter. The human species as it appears on Earth today, emerged from the propagules that streamed from M42 and seeded in the home planet. One of the ancient schools of the mysteries, named after the Orphics, registered this fact on a sacred object found in Petilia, southern Italy. The Petilia tablet, circa 400 BCE, is a small square of gold leaf that was given as an amulet to those who underwent a certain initiation, making them intimate with the gnosis of human origins. The inscription says, I am a child of earth and starry heaven, but my origin is in heaven alone. You yourselves know this. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in nine episodes. Episode four, Unilateral Dreaming
In the galactic arms, planets, comets, and stars arise and dissolve over incalculable periods of time. The granular material of the spiral arms is the dema, dense elementary matter arrays. It consists mainly of microscopic dust, the debris of former worlds, continually recycling into new worlds, including planetary systems. Such systems are cosmic habitats that provide the conditions for manifold life forms to arise. They are planetary laboratories for experiments with the diverse novel species projected by the aeons from the galactic core. The laws of physics in the Kenoma, the galactic arms, are different from those in the Paroma, the core. In wonderment at her designer species, the Anthropos, the Aeon Sophia beholds the genomic template nestled in M42, the Orion Nebula, like an infant gestating in the womb. With intense concern, she anticipates how it will develop. Once the species is projected, the Aeons do not interfere in its development. Their interest in each experiment of their inception remains detached, uninvolved with some rare exceptions. They allow the experiment to develop on its own terms in freedom. They let it unfold without foreseeing or influencing its outcome. Such are the aeonic protocols. Time for the generators runs to countless billions of years, far beyond the range of human measurement. Nevertheless, it scales in proportion with human time. One day for the galactic powers transpires in 26,000 years. Over many aeonic days, running into millions of years, the community of the Paroma observed the seeding of the anthropic genome in different planetary laboratories. They observe how propagules of the germinal plasm separate, one by one and in clusters, to be carried by plasmic currents through interstellar space until they drift down into a favourable habitat, an Earth-like planet. The experiment really begins when a species emerges, assumes animal form, and creates a domain for itself, responding to the specific conditions of the home planet. Its behaviour reveals how it fulfils its endowment, or not. Together with her counterpart, Thelite, and the other aeons, Sophia studies this long-term process of emergence. The galactic powers attend closely to how the experimental species achieves its pre-designed form and then behaves according to the exact calibration that defines it in evolutionary terms. Over millions of years, which to them are merely months, they see the Anthropos come to expression in nine distinct world systems, nine planetary laboratories located here and there in the galactic arms. Doing so, they notice something unusual. Each time the genome achieves animal form in a planetary laboratory, eventually the experiment goes awry. Something causes the behavior of the anthropos to become unstable and erratic so that it works against itself. In nine instances, the experiments crash. Sophia is the youngest of the aeons in the Paroma. Never having designed a species before, she is perplexed by these outcomes. Each time an experiment goes off course, she feels growing concern. Why, she wonders, does it not proceed to its optimal expression? How come her designer species does not succeed in expressing the endowment of its skill set. This turn of events, repeated nine times, begins to trouble the wisdom goddess. She feels responsible for the inferior results, but powerless to do anything about what's happening. Mounting perplexity compels her to picture how each experiment might have gone differently had she been able to intervene, acting against aeonic protocols. But there is an exception to the protocols. Sophia knew of it by observing genomic experiments initiated by other, more advanced aeons. In some cases, 
they opted for an advanced technique of intervention, avataric descent. It allows the aeon to descend from the pleroma and enter the setting of the experiment. Doing so, the aeon assumes an animate form, some kind of creature able to perform in that specific habitat. That creature, the avatar, then proceeds to act upon the problem or fault in the experiment and correct it. The Aeon Sophia is not practiced in avataric descent, yet she feels passionately compelled to intervene out of love for what she has designed. So she does the next best thing within her powers. She applies pranoia, the aeonic power of intention, to a kind of rehearsal exercise. Reviewing the crashed experiments one by one, she pictures how she would have intended to intervene and keep the species on course to its utmost success, the optimal expression of its endowed skills. All nine times, Sophia imagines a specific act of avataric descent as she would have performed it had she known how to do so. The intensity of concentration on this exercise of rescue turns the wisdom goddess away from the other aeons, including Thelate. The absorption required to work out these nine scenarios, all by herself, begins to isolate her. With each incident, she draws more deeply upon her dreaming power, the primary creative tool of an aeon. She involves herself in the fate of the Anthropos, her designer species. She does not share her mother-like concern with her counterpart, Thelate. Instead, she dwells upon it independently. Normally, Aeons act dyadically, as she and Thelate had done when designing the anthropic genome. Sophia now begins to dream unilaterally, totally on her own. Her continuing review of the faulty development of the Anthropos prompts Sophia to seek the cause of the breakdowns. She recalls vividly how she and Thelate had superdosed the Anthropos so that it would possess genius potential. Their calibration for the genome was set to a high standard of performance. Now Sophia wonders if the genome was not geared too high, investing the species with capacities it could not adequately control or even restrain. Her desire to manifest a genius species may have produced something like a reckless monster. It shocks Sophia to consider that her experiment involves a prodigy so gifted that it cannot manage its own excessive talents. The dramatic failure of the nine anthropic strains arouses deep longing in Sophia. She concentrates, to the exclusion of all else, on the spectacle of the anthropic template nested in M42 in the galactic arms. There it glows softly, an amber stain flushed with magenta and pinpointed with young stars. The attractive pull of that cosmic sight becomes overwhelming. It excites the divine enthusiasm of the Aeon, her enthymesis, and once excited, it mounts to a screaming pitch. The compulsion to assist her troubled species finally breaks all boundaries of restraint. It steers Sophia's body of torrential currents outward beyond the limit of the galactic core. The strength of her desire to intervene in the next experiment, so that it does not go off course, exceeds all reservation. It plunges her through the boundary of the Pleroma and outward she goes, erupting in an immense luminous plume across the dark matter of the galactic arms. This event is the fall of the Wisdom Goddess. For committing this reckless act of passion, Sophia is called Prunikos, outrageous, audacious, daring to exceed the rules. Expansion Planetary systems are laboratories for aeonic experiments. Although the aeons are alive, indeed super alive, and organic in their own way, animated creaturely life does not arise in the Pleroma, 
nor do stars, even though the substance of the aeons is star material. The plasmic torrents of the sky dragons consists of stellar matter in a raw primordial state, comparable to cake batter in a mixer. Likewise, nucleic acid, the substrate for calibration of a species, exists in the paroma but does not assume discrete life forms. That only happens with aeonic projection that leads to the seeding of the species in a habitable world such as an Earth-like planet. Aeonic substance is like molten pearl. It is porous like nougat. It has the inexplicable property of infinite density and zero mass. Weight does not exist in the pleroma and no gravity either, only levity. Consequently, the hub of a spiral galaxy floats. By contrast, the massive structure of the spiraling arms is heavy, weighted by the material of physical worlds, including astronomical bodies such as suns, comets, planets. The bodies that continually form and dissolve in the kenoma ultimately have the same basis in the dema, dense elementary matter arrays. This is granulated material, cosmic dust and ash able to combine with water and form organic compounds. There is an old saying, the mills of the gods grind slow, but they grind exceeding fine. This is as good as any scientific proposition that might be proposed to explain the mechanism of perpetual recycling in the pinwheel arms of a galaxy. The Paroma is like an observation booth for scientists who keep track of experiments they have set up to unfold outside the booth in a controlled environment. Normally, according to protocols, they do not leave the booth and enter the experiment in progress. Were they to do so, they would not have the pleasure of seeing how the experiment unfolds on its own terms. The aeons conduct experiments according to laws of freedom and spontaneity but they are also free to make exceptions. In other words, freedom to follow protocols in a voluntary way is balanced by freedom to forgo them. The anthropic plasm settles in the nebula cloud of M42, but it does not remain there in a static condition. A distinct species plasm, the genome, is naturally interactive with plasmic streams that surge all through the universe. There is no empty void anywhere. Everything in the universe belongs to the grand weave of electrical fields rippled throughout by Birkeland currents. Astronomers today describe these currents as filamentary and confirm that description by photos. They have also detected and photographed extended fields or veils, such as the Veil Nebula in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. M42 is such a field. The propagules of a species will eventually drift into a Birkeland current and stream away from its nesting locale. Like an acorn that drops into a brook to be carried downstream, where it can wash up on fertile soil and sprout. Only when a species genome has seeded in a favorable habitat can it sprout into the animal inherent to its design. The aeons observed this happen nine times in various Earth-like settings across the galactic arms in proximity of the Orion Nebula. These Earth-like planets were not previous versions of the Earth inhabited by the human species today. They were other Earths, home planets to other variations of the single genome, the Anthropos. Human life derived from that specific genome has already come to expression elsewhere in this galaxy. On these nine occasions, however, something went amiss. Those human animals ended up behaving in a way that caused the experiment in their setting to crash. That is to say, they somehow failed to make the most of their divine endowment and bring it to success, success defined as the flowering of the full actualization of human potential 
manifested in harmony with its habitat. The wisdom goddess is a young Aeon by comparison to Thelate, who is rather older, and the veterans of the Pleroma much older. The older Aeons have initiated countless experiments, while Sophia is a relative beginner. And as it turns out, she is something of an upstart, inclined to act on her own. Together with Thelate, she had dosed the human genome with a skill set ideally designed to produce self-actualization at a genius level. Observing the nine experiments that crashed in one way or another, Sophia realized that they had superdosed the Anthropos. Consequently, it proved incapable of handling its own talents to their full benefit. This situation so concerned her that she retreated into herself to ponder it and wondered how to remedy it, pulling away from the other aeons. Doing so, she indulged in unilateral dreaming. From observing the older aeons, Sophia knew about a technique they use, avataric descent. It allows them the exception of intervening in a divine experiment in progress. The mechanism of the avatar is a kind of virtual body projected into the laboratory setting where intervention is to be accomplished. The creaturely or organic form of the avatar may be human-like or theriomorphic, taking the form of an animal. But Sophia had not tried that technique. She lacked practice, so she could not undertake it at will. Nevertheless, she pictured how she would if she could. With each incident where she imagined herself come to the rescue of her troubled child, the intensity of her desire for involvement deepened. Finally, Sophia's desire to intervene overwhelmed her. She could no longer gaze helplessly upon the embryonic form of the Anthropos cradled in M42 and hold back her passionate concern for its future. Her torrential plasmic body, in its totality, responded with a surge of enthymesis, divine enthusiasm. The surge pulled her to the bounding limit of the Pleroma and forced her through it. Sophia erupted as an enormous plume of plasmic luminosity and steamed laterally across the galactic arms toward M42. Summary the setting of episode 1 through 4 of the FGS is the Pleroma, the galactic core. At the conclusion of episode 4, the narrative shifts to extra Pleromic events. Sophia's exception to Aeonic protocols is one of those stunning incidents in the sacred narrative. The Nag Hammadi writings preserve a concise statement for the protocol on unilateral dreaming. For it is the will of the originator not to allow anything to happen in the Pleroma apart from a syzygy. A Valentinian Exposition 36.25 Syzygy is an odd Greek word used by astronomers for the conjunction of celestial bodies. In plain English, a coupling, pairing, match. The preference of the originator that generators work in pairs, dyads, is again another one of those novel, startling notions that come to attention in learning the narrative. It is a preference and not a strict law. As the aeons leave their experiments free to develop on their own terms, so the originator leaves the aeons free to follow this protocol or not. Creative freedom is inherent in the foundation of the universe. The nine experiments witnessed from the Pleroma have been depicted in the imagination of Vedic seers, the Rishis, as the nine incarnations of Vishnu. The fall of the wisdom goddess is an astronomical fact described in mythopoetic language. The Gnostic myth describes events that actually happened in the home galaxy. And it can be proven that this description in its full scope and detail is accurate, supported by evidence. 
Extensive research by Thunderbolts Project, EU Plasma Cosmology, offers high resolution photographs of plasma jets erupting from galaxies. This phenomenon is by now well established. The fall of the wisdom goddess is a plasma jet eruption. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 5, Impact Zone Sophia's plunge into the galactic arms produces a bizarre, unforeseen effect. The impact of super-living pleuromic luminosity on the Dama is extremely violent. Her torrential force splatters on the third arm like the surge of a fire hose hitting a sandy beach. But what blasts from the hose is more like cool, radiant, foaming lava than water. The material of the kenoma does not normally undergo an impact such as this. It causes the random star, planet, or comet in the affected region to bounce away if it does not immediately disintegrate. This disruption is colossal, but it is the soot and ash in the granular cloud of the dama that take the full brunt of the impact. Sophia at first cannot reckon what is happening. From the locale of the Pleroma, she has observed many experiments, but none involving an aeon isolated in direct immersion in the Dama. She is momentarily dazed to find herself in the unknown territory of the galactic arms, where the conditions, laws, and properties of physics are different. Her plasmic substance is buoyant and porous, like foam, though infinitely dense. The density of the dama is a new sensation. It is heavy and encumbering. The high compression induces a kind of paralysis that impedes her kinetic forces. And the illumination of space outside the pleroma is also an unknown event. Until now, the Aeon has never observed the light in the galactic arms by immediate proximity. It strikes her not like light, but a form of shadow that gleams and glitters with a metallic sheen, a hint of reptilian skin. She can hear no familiar sound. The glorious mantric chiming of the Aeons is absent. Instead, there is a raucous, kirkamambient pitch like the screech of tearing metal. As her perception clears, the first thing Sophia sees is the impact crater resulting from her plunge. It looks like a huge bubble divided into two parts, one larger than the other. She is both in the bubble and, in some disturbing way, she is it. And the bubble also has bubbles. The sensation that she is covered with protrusions like warts, jolts into her field of attention. Also, there is a darkening cast on her aeonic luminosity. Not at the interior, where total whiteness persists, but creeping around the edges of the impact zone. The feeling it gives her is somber and eerie. Now a spectacle of action emerges, spreading all around her, symmetrical waves that look frozen like metallic bands, yet they move. This is the ripple of her impact in the elementary matter of the Dama. The waves multiply in fractal repetition. Wherever the ripples spread, crest and break, a shape appears, always the same shape, replicating itself. Not the shape of a living creature such as the countless animal types designed in the Pleroma, Rather, a non-living creature that resembles an aborted fetus. The sight is weird and stilted, unlike anything even an Aeon might imagine. Yet Sophia recognises in it the semblance of something she knows. The embryonic stage of the Anthropos, the human creature she and Thelite designed in the Pleroma. Arising endlessly from the fractal expansion of the impact zone, these forms ride the ripples and simultaneously 
the ripples propagate the forms. As the fire observes closely, the freakish embryo seems to morph into another shape, like a seahorse, as if the ripples were waves composed of seahorse shapes with no difference between the waves and what rides them. This spectacle arouses total astonishment and brings the fire to a heightened state of attention. For the first time, Sophia clearly registers the propagation of an inorganic species, archons. Thus is the unintended effect of her lateral plunge into the galactic arms, spontaneous generation of an inorganic species. With increasing power of attention, Sophia watches the spectacle around her shift, as if in response to being detected. With a rush like a rapid outgoing tide, the impact zone dissolves and she regains her torrential luminosity. In an instant, the fractal ocean of seahorse waves fades away. She is free and clear, rotating slowly at a dwell point in the galactic arms, not far from the Orion Nebula. At this location, she holds the ideal position to contemplate the object of her devoted interest, her designer species, the Anthropos. But Sophia is not spared a moment to dwell on that glorious sight, due to what happens next. The high-pitched metallic ring of her impact now returns amplified. She directs her attention to it and immediately locates its source, a murky swarming cloud that has arisen upon the tidal withdrawal of the fractal sea. The emergent archons have shed their earlier appearance as if it were merely a carapace, the chrysalis of an insect. And indeed, the dark, keening mass that now appears is an insect-like horde. The archons have morphed into a swarm of celestial locusts. The swarm surges aggressively, without sense or order, constantly emitting the shrill, metallic sound. Sophia cannot behold this event indifferently. She cannot ignore or avoid the assault directed upon her by a force field totally alien to her aeonic awareness. It poses a monumental distraction, pulling her attention away from M42. How can she act to quell the horrific commotion? Continued observation reveals that this aberrant species has no informing intelligence and no will of its own. The Archons lack creative intelligence, noose, and ennoia intention. Their mental field is frantic and fractious. Nevertheless, they do exhibit evidence of hive mind mentality. Thus, they do possess a collective field of attention. This attribute presents the Aeon with an opportunity to control them. Sophia seizes the attention of the swarm and takes command of it for an instant. By her aeonic power of pronoia, she discharges a spark of intelligence into the Archon hive mind. She lends to the Archons what they do not innately possess, the capacity inherent to all that is truly alive, autopoesis, self-organization. This action is provisional, for she realizes they will not know what to do with such intelligence. No matter about that, for she already conceives a second tactic to manage this pestilent intrusion. What she does next is a masterful feat of manipulation. The Archons lack the ability to create or construct, but Sophia keenly observes that they are not entirely devoid of skill or instinct. Their behavior shows that they do possess one outstanding capacity to imitate. The Archons are a mimetic species. Each entity in the swarm does exactly what the others do. Sophia sees how she can turn this behavior to her advantage. Having received a vicarious dose of aeonic intelligence, the Archons can now be steered on a course of activity. The aim is simple. Occupy their attention and distract them from distracting her. The tactic is also simple. Give them something to do with their borrowed intelligence. Again, by application of pronoia, 
the wisdom goddess projects into the hive mind the image of the cymatic designs in the pleroma, glorious patterns of beauty and symmetry. In the galactic core, torrents of divine luminosity dance in perpetual motion, blending and separating in kaleidoscopic pulsations of superlife. Sophia provides the archons with that splendorous display to imitate. Immediately, the celestial locusts converge upon their primary activity, mimesis. They engage the spark of creative intelligence lent by Sophia to replicate what she reveals to them. The tactic works. It rids Sophia of the vexation they imposed on her field of attention. The archons are still in proximity, but she can now proceed to face her situation free of that bizarre intrusion. The wisdom goddess turns her attention to the anthropic template nested in the nebula of Orion like a newborn in a cradle. Immeasurable ages are merely days in the life of the Aeon Sophia. She dwells at length on the site of the Anthropos, her designer species. Doing so, she regains composure. Her torrential substance recovers from the shock of impact. Now she can enjoy a measure of innate harmony. Her serpentine currents now tend to collect in a whirlpool. Conforming to the thinness of the galactic arm, the whirlpool flattens. It gradually closes upon itself, allowing the Aeon to collect and conserve the full array of her Aeonic life forces and capacities. Settling into poise, Sophia assumes the shape of the Euroboros, the serpent eating its own tail. Now, finally, she can turn her attention to the Anthropos template embedded in M42. Thus, the Aeon secures her territory in the galactic arms, free to consider what to do next. But her situation is not as secure as it might appear. The distraction given to the Archons is not a passive event. Sophia's tactic invested them with the semblance of creative ability as a ploy to engage their mimetic powers. What she could not foresee is how intently and extensively they would exploit that brilliant plot. For the Archons are an aberrant species that arose without a habitat, but now they can construct one. To do so, they replicate the living fractal patterns of the Pleroma in a non-living construction, a simulacrum. What they thus construct provides them with a habitat in the shadowy region of the galactic arms. The simulacrum of the Archons is the Stereoma, a clockwork cosmos constructed of inorganic parts that amass into planetary orbs. They mine the Dama for the raw materials to devise their own habitat. The result is a lifeless mechanism that mimics the pleuromic designs Sophia revealed to them. It is a stereographic projection of the cymatic beauty of the aeonic dimension, absent the innate properties of life. The stereoma is an inorganic planetary system. For the archons, it is like a theme park suited to their character. Unable to support water, an atmosphere, land, and living organisms, it cannot be the setting for an aeonic experiment with organic life plans and natural designs. Its working parts simulate the numbering of aeonic proportions, divine geometry, a carousel of six inorganic bodies in flat orbits. The stereoma is jointed on a circle of pivots balanced on a seventh point, forming a hexagon. At the center of the stereoma is the dwell point of the entire construction, the planet Saturn. For Sophia, the Archons are no longer a demanding intrusion. Their world system hovers in her proximity, enclosed by the Euroboros form she has assumed. She registers the presence of the stereoma as a minute fleck, like a floater in the field of vision. It is distinctly a foreign deposit alien to her aeonic sensibility. It is a mechanical monstrosity unseemly and clunky, ugly by aeonic standards of beauty. But at least it gets that swarm of locusts 
out of her way. The archons no longer distract her from contemplating the molecular cloud in Orion M42, where the Anthropos template hovers like a pattern of dew on a spider's web. So close, just offside the boundary of her rotating serpentine vortex, the Euroboros. The sight of it is immensely attractive. It inspires the fallen goddess to turn her attention fully to what she loves, the product of her own creative genius. Yet Sophia cannot dismiss the impression that the floater is somehow menacing, even sinister. Expansion. An outstanding line in the Gnostic writings says, the world system as you know it came about due to a mistake. Mistake can also be translated anomaly, transgression, boundary violation, or exception. This statement is without question one of the outstanding features of the fallen goddess scenario. Nothing comparable to it can be found in any other cosmology from any culture or race. Interpretation? The planetary system inhabited by the human species is an anomaly in the cosmic order due to a unique and specific event, namely the plunge of the Aeon Sophia laterally across the galactic limbs. The inadvertent effect of this plunge is the generation of the Archons, as it is called in Gnostic jargon, and the plot thickens, as the narrative will reveal, the Saturn-centred planetary habitat constructed by the Archons is not the solar system where the Earth is located today. Every detail of Sophianic cosmology can be verified or corroborated by the results of genuine investigation in astrophysics, but only genuine investigation not quantum physics, relativity theory, string theory, holographic theory, or such pseudosciences which are totally infected with specious and unverifiable claims. EU plasma cosmology comes closest to the type of genuine, verifiable astrophysics that can complement Sophianic cosmology. Sophia's impact zone will be expanded upon using the Mandelbrot set at the conclusion of this episode. The substance of aeonic luminosity is alive or super-alive, sentient, self-aware, and possessing abilities comparable to those seen in all kingdoms of living creatures. The assertion of a god-level type of thinking, discernment, emotive response, and cognitive ability, the capacity to act by intention, is not a matter of faith in Sophianic cosmology. It is a working hypothesis based on the premise that the superliving supernatural matrix of life must contain and exhibit all the properties that are evident in the spectrum of living forms. This is a premise to be tested, not accepted on blind faith. Sophia's two-step tactic for handling the archons, first, endow them with a fractional spark of creative intelligence, noose, and then present them with a model to mimic, as replication is their innate faculty. Likewise, AI devices can replicate processes programmed for them by humans, even though they have no ability to originate such processes. The Archons present the cosmic prototype of AI, artificial intelligence. AI in the world today is an archontic medium. However, the concept of artificial intelligence is erroneous and misleading. Life is intelligent. Otherwise said, intelligence is the basic property of living forms, from microbes to blue whales and everything in between. By the Gnostic standard, intelligence is exclusively the property of living organic creatures. AI mimics living intelligence, but it is neither alive nor organic. It is an inorganic mental system that can, but only in limited and stilted ways, mimic organic intelligence. It might better be designated MI, mimetic intelligence. Artificial intelligence as such does not exist. 
All that is alive is intelligent, and all that is truly intelligence is alive. That also is a perfect refutation of the hive mind of the archons. Gnostic cosmology describes the stereoma as a kind of theme park construction, the Disney world of the archons. It is not an immaterial construct, like a hologram with no material basis except what is required for its projection as a standing image. The stereoma is constructed of material mined from the daima of the galactic arms. It is an inorganic planetary system based on a module of six orbs and a center point, Saturn. Episode 5 describes the Aeon Sophia assuming the form of a whirlpool vortex, the Euroboros, the serpent eating its own tail. The location of this vortex is precise and can be observed today, although the vortex itself is no longer there, of course. Its location was in close proximity to the Orion Nebula in the third galactic arm. The Mandelbrot Set French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot produced the set by plotting fractal iterations in a graphic display. This exercise is easily reproduced. The programmer feeds the computer a simple equation, then the computer feeds the result of that equation back into the original equation and on and on to billions of repeats or iterations. The fractal patterns thus generated are not alive, not organic, nor are they the cause of fractal patterns that exist in nature. CGI fractals are archontic. Fractality in nature is organic. The obvious difference can be seen by comparing a detail of the set to a plant, the fiddlehead fern, for example. Fortunately, or better said, fortuitously, the CGI of the Mandelbrot set presents an exact image of Sophia's impact zone in the galactic arms. As an aeon, Sophia has a force body permeated with the superliving, supernatural currents that operate fractally. Her innate nature is autopoetic, self-organizing. Consequently, when she impacts the elementary field of the Dema, it aggravates into a lifeless semblance of fractality. Computer simulation is ideal for illustrating the cosmic event of the generation of the archons, because the archons themselves are an inorganic, AI-minded species. In other words, the medium fits the event to be illustrated. Summary Episode 5 stands at the midpoint of the nine-episode narrative. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 6, The Three-Body Solution Sophia gathers her torrential coils into a braid that closes into a ring, forming the Euroboros. The slow rotation of the ring allows the Aeon to find her boundaries. The galactic arm is a shallow river filled with pinpoint stars and ribbons of plasma that stream in erratic patterns. Comets dart and dive like fireflies. Here and there, nebulas glow like blotches of coloured ink. Silence prevails, but within it there is the soft crackle of electric discharges, and from the far distance, the low steady hum of the galactic core. Like an enclosing reef, Sophia's body separates what is without from what is within. This interior harbour zone shelters the floater of the stereoma. The Archon domain hovers unsteadily, as if it might collapse at any moment. It lacks the centrifugal force to lock into an orbit, as planetary systems do, and besides, there is no central body for it to circle around. At its core, Saturn maintains a precarious poise. Momentarily, at least, the distraction is contained, and makes no demands on Sophia's attention. Outside, beyond the outer boundary of the harbour zone, a glorious sight looms into view. Sophia's proximity to the Orion Nebula, M42, brings the template of the Anthropos into high definition. What an enthralling vision it is! 
there is the genomic design that she and Thelate had created in the Paroma, but not the compressed form of its origination. Now it appears immensely expanded, a jewel-like mesh hung in the molecular cloud like dew on a spider's web. The droplets of genomic substance, nucleic acid, glitter with moisture drawn from the water clouds that saturate the nebula. The jeweled net clusters around four stars in the heart of M42, the trapezium. The close-up view of the template reveals the intricate details of its construction. Sophia beholds the calibration of the genome and inspects it with passionate interest. Doing so, she recalls the nine previous experiments that crashed when the Anthropos, in one way or another, mishandled its divine endowment. What was it about the combination of faculties endowed in her designer species that caused it to behave erratically, acting against its own development? And what could be expected to happen next when a new strain emerges and seeds in a favourable world? Sophia knows that a tenth extract of the plasm is due for release from the nebula, drawn on plasmic filaments toward a planet that will provide its home. When will that happen? What planet will that be? Where can it be found in the galactic arms? Such questions arise, and most urgent of all, does Sophia intervene, as she pondered doing before in the observations from the Pleroma? If so, how can she take advantage of finding herself in the Kenoma to guide the next strain of the Anthropos toward a different outcome? There is constant activity around the embedded template. Molecular clouds are nurseries of star birth, where solar bodies continually arise. They appear first in subtle electrical flickering, like fireflies. Then they morph into gigantic spheres of concentrated luminosity, young bluish suns. One by one, they gain the axial posture that allows them to spin into free movement as sovereign bodies. Then they venture out on different trajectories and cruise regally into the galactic arms. The spin and thrust of one particular star catches Sophia's attention. Never has she witnessed such activity from the vantage of the Kenema. Now she is so close to it that the electric charge of the solar body reaches her and excites a response. With the same telekinetic power she used to commandeer the Archon Swarm, she engages the force field of the approaching sun. Her pranoia discharges a tentacle of rippling blue-green electricity to draw it in her direction. She directs its course downward, allowing it to pass her bounding ring from below as no solar body can enter a mass of aeonic luminosity and maintain its form. Then, as if responding to her call, the newborn star ascends and floats serenely into the sheltering zone of the Euroboros. The arrival of the newborn star, Savitri, is totally novel. Sophia did not anticipate this event, undertaken on her part, without a clear intention. But immediately she realises the advantage it might provide to her. Since gaining composure, the conditions for the next emergent strain of the Anthropos stand foremost in her concerns. Can she affect some kind of intervention? Is there anything she can do? acting from the locale of the galactic arms that she could not have done acting from the Pleroma. In fact, there is a solution, and she is uniquely placed to provide it. Already when Sophia observed the nine failed experiments from the Pleroma, this solution came into view. Then and there it was only a prospect, something she could picture but not accomplish. But here in the Kenema, she could make it happen. The presence of Savitri signals Sophia to the opportunity for intervention. The solution was simple and elegant. With the brilliance of a young Aeon, Sophia understood that the optimal setting for a genomic experiment is composed of three bodies, a central star, an orbiting planet, and a planetary satellite. 
That is the three-body solution. Genomes could emerge in different variations of planetary systems, of course, some of them comprising dozens of planets, or a single planet orbiting a star, or even a roaming planet on its own. But those variations did not meet the standard of elegant, beautiful simplicity demonstrated in the three-body system. Sophia intended the highest standard of cosmic order as the setting for the next experiment of the Anthropos, thus providing the optimal chance for it to succeed in manifesting its divine endowment. That unique setting for the experiment would assure its best outcome. To provide the three-body system is the act of intervention she could achieve, Sophia realised. Her confidence on meeting that challenge is total and unwavering. And with the support of Savitri, it can be accomplished. Sophia has barely a moment to consider this tremendous prospect before a huge commotion breaks out, coming from the direction of the Archons. Their clockwork cosmos, unstable from the outset, is suddenly on the brink of collapse. The six planets are detaching from their orbits, and the entire construction is on the verge of shattering. The central mass, Saturn, cannot maintain the orbital load. The dwell point it provides is insufficient to support the system. The Archons flee their collapsing platform. Maddened by the loss of their habitat, they rampage back and forth across the enclosure of Sophia's circling ring. The cosmic distraction returns, but this time it is more like a violent attack. Once again, Sophia faces the risk of expending her powers to constrain the alien species. As before, the crisis calls for decisive action, but this time, Sophia does not face the plight alone. All across the Kenema, stars like Savitri support planetary systems in countless variations. They provide the dwell point for the machinery of orbiting planets. But in the stereoma of the Archons, the force field of Saturn was not sufficient to hold the centre, for Saturn is not a star. Now the presence of Savitri offers what Saturn did not provide. The young star partakes in the intention of Sophia and acts in her stead. It approaches the collapsing stereoma and rapidly assumes the position held by Saturn, which it swings into orbit. The body that was central to the world system of the Archons now locks on an orbital track held steady by the centering power of a star. Savitri captures Saturn. Tremendous electrical discharges surge across the harbour zone as Savitri organises the elementary field of the Dema into the scaffolding of another planetary system, the second Archon world. Sophia coordinates closely with this activity. To reinforce the new platform for the Archons to inhabit, she fashions a set of super-thin gyroscopic plates, the rings of Saturn. She restores the original hexagonal dynamic of the stereoma, making it integral with the ring structure. The hexagon imprinted on Saturn is the signature of the alien species, and the Archons now flock to it. They furiously resume the reconstruction of what collapsed, once again replicating the living geometry of the Pleroma in lifeless mechanics. Within the harbour zone arises a seven-planet system centred on Savitri, with Saturn now situated at the outer boundary, the second stereoma, which persists to this day. Eons of immeasurable time pass, but they are merely days to the Aeon Sophia. The bond with Savitri alleviates her isolation, but something now troubles the wisdom goddess more than ever. What happened to the opportunity to arrange the three-body system as the ideal laboratory setting for the Anthropos? Savitri's presence afforded that possibility at first. With the central star provided, one-third of the solution was in place. 
The challenge that remained for Sophia was to complete the world system by the addition of a home planet and a satellite. She had barely begun to undertake that task when events overtook her. Now the opportunity appears to be lost, for the companionable star cannot serve as the centering pivot of two systems at once. Sophia does not even have a single component to construct a three-body system. Troubled and uncertain of what to do next, Sophia returns her attention to the nearby spectacle of the glittering template embedded in M42. The full range of her aeonic faculties now concentrate there. Her designer child needs a home planet for its next adventure. In the Paroma, Sophia could not provide it, even though she had witnessed the act of planetary creation performed by the older, more skilled aeons. That spectacular feat was then beyond her powers. But now, in the Kenema, it might still somehow come within her reach. Her present situation is still replete with unknowns. So different are the laws of physics in the galactic arms. Nonetheless, Sophia does not surrender the intention to enact an intervention of some kind. And as she ponders how to achieve it, the compulsion for the three-body solution grows ever and ever stronger. Expansion the adventure of the Aeon Sophia unfolds in the home galaxy, so-called because it is the cosmic locale of the solar system that contains the home planet, Earth. Modern astrophysics claim, as one of its highest achievements, the detailed mapping of the entire galaxy. The home galaxy, also called the Orion Galaxy, is a four or possibly five-armed lenticular spiral. Lenticular means lentil-shaped. The galaxy has a bulge at the core, surrounded by the thin encircling limbs. All the region it occupies is within galactic space. Above and below this structure is intergalactic space. Galactic space is filled with stars, suns, some of which support planetary systems. It is also populated with nebulas in many shapes and sizes. The solar system can be compared to a fleet of ships sailing along the river of the third galactic arm, counting outwards from the core, the Paroma. Imagined from above, the galaxy rotates clockwise and the arms stream away in opposite direction, differential rotation, counterclockwise. The arms are thus like flowing rivers wide and shallow. The solar fleet moves upstream along the third arm. The location of the solar system is therefore not fixed in position because it travels. Its placement in the third arm comes about due to the plasma jet expulsion of Sophia having traveled laterally across the arms to a point where it terminated or splashed down. That is the impact zone described in episode five. It is situated in close proximity to the Orion Nebula, M42, which is visible to the naked eye from Earth. DNA has been defined as a periodic crystal, vital substance arranged in a complex geometric pattern. The genomic template of the Anthropos is a complex geometric structure composed of nucleic acid. Its proportions are immense, encompassing a distance of hundreds of light years within the vastness of the Orion Nebula. The template gathers around the tight constellation of four bright stars in the nebula, the trapezium, so called due to its trapezoidal form. Like other nebulas in the unknown universe, M42 is a nursery for the birth of stars, solar bodies. The fallen goddess scenario accords with the theory of star formation by electrical field activity proposed in plasma cosmology rather than following the assumptions of conventional astrophysics. The latest state-of-the-art research in astrophysics reveals that molecular clouds that act as solar nurseries contain water and thus can support the primary elements of life 
such as nucleic acid and proteins. According to Gnostic cosmology, planetary formation in the galactic limbs can occur in two ways, by direction from the pleroma, with the intention to establish specific conditions for life before it emerges on the planet, or spontaneously due to the continuous recycling of the elementary fields of the daima, dust, soot, gases, etc. The elder, more experienced aeons can produce pre-designed planets, a feat comparable to terraforming. Sophia is a younger aeon who does not yet have the skills required for that task. That being so, she must restrict her desire for intervention to other strategies. When she observed the nine previous experiments with the Anthropos from the Pleroma, she pictured interventions, rescue missions, that could have been accomplished through avataric descent, assuming the form of a creature that could operate in the world to be rescued. Finding herself in the Kenema, the region of the galactic arms, totally changes the prospect of intervention. It affords her with opportunities for intervention that arise outside the Paroma, but she does not immediately see what these opportunities are or how to exploit them. There is one thing she does see, however, with absolute clarity and certainty, the chance to arrange a three-body system, the most elegant of all possible settings for a divine experiment. Gnostic cosmological writings from Nag Hammadi, specifically on the origin of the world, describe the collapse of the first archontic system, thus supporting this extraordinary detail in episode 6 of FGS. It appears that the proponents of EU plasma cosmology, Thunderbolt's project, are intent on developing a similar scenario. Wall Thornhill and others often refer to a presumed preformation of the solar system antecedent to its current form. They describe it as a massive alignment with Saturn at the apex, defining the axis that holds the other planets in position. However, it is unclear how the Earth fits into this alignment. In Gnostic cosmology, the Earth did not exist at the time the first stereoma was constructed. That is a huge difference between the two cosmological paradigms which otherwise match up in remarkable ways. The three-body system that Sophia deems to be the ideal habitat for her designer species is a supremely elegant construct, utterly simple and awesomely beautiful in its complexity. It can be defined by a question. Given that the mass, location, and velocity of three celestial bodies in space can be known, what would the convergence of their interacting orbits look like? How would it play out in action, unfolding as an autonomous event? For Sophia, this proposition, called the three-body problem, holds tremendous attraction. It appeals strongly to the aesthetic factor of her intelligence, which is paramount. Sophia's priorities are all about beauty. In her vision for the future of her designer species, the three-body system is the optimal setting for life. Its beauty matches the harmonic integrity she designed into the human species. Aeonic techniques of intervention are not open to her due to her youthful status, nor could she have custom-designed a planet specifically to serve as the laboratory for an experiment with the Anthropos. Her situation in the galactic arms is novel and exceptional, presenting many unknowns and difficulties. At the same time, due to her proximity to the dynamics of solar and planetary formation, it may offer the chance to attempt that rare feat of customization. The audacity of youth, combined with the brilliance particular to her intelligence compel Sophia to seek the ultimate solution, according with the highest standard of beauty and elegance in the universe. Summary 
Episode 6 is supercharged with action on the galactic scale. Upon regaining her composure, Sophia has to confront some pressing developments. What happens in this passage of the narrative could as well be described in the technical language of astrophysics. It could even be represented in mathematical formulas for plasma discharge, electrical field dynamics and solar rotation. The anthropomorphic rendering that attributes human-like capacities and emotions to the Aeon Sophia does not alter or distort the events underway. Rather, it adds to the bare propositions of physics the element of empathy and enables participation in the drama of cosmic events. Empathy for the Aeonic Mother is the key to learning the Sophianic myth. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 7 Divine Defiance Eons of immeasurable time transpire, unfolding as mere days to the Star Goddess. The bond with Savitri alleviates Sophia's isolation and affords a measure of serenity. The newborn sun settles into an orbit along the inner boundary of the harbour zone as if cruising inside a reef of molten pearl. The orbit is vast and the revolution slow at first, but it gains speed as electrical tension between the solar body and the aeon intensifies. The growing momentum of the orbiting star exerts a strange pull on her currents, engendering a longing she has never felt before. Combined with the slow but enormous drift of the galactic arms, as the galaxy turns, it induces fields of torque and flattening, to which she must adapt. The serpentine rings tighten as it puckers and contracts. The unfamiliar stress in the plane of the galactic limbs seems to be pulling the Sophia toward a sinkhole. The hollowing of a gravity well is a total unknown, for there is no gravity in the Pleroma. Sophia holds steady in her station before the Orion Nebula. Ever mindful of the presence of Savitri, she concentrates on the three-body cosmos and wonders how it might be constructed. Were that possible, she would set it adrift like an arc on the galactic stream directly before Orion so that the next strain of the Anthropos released from M42 would find its way there immediately and take passage in safety, or she could use her pranoia to guide it there. How does an aeon create a planet custom-fitted to a pre-designed species, and how can the planet be supplied with a satellite, a moon? Such a task might be accomplished acting from the Pleroma, for the reach of the telekinetic vectors of the aeons extends to the outmost reaches of the galaxies they inhabit. But Sophia is not in the Pleroma, and even if she were, the young Aeon had only observed those feats on occasion. She had not learned how to perform them. Stranded in the Kenema, she would first have to master the forces at play in the extrapleromic environment. Beyond that, it would take a master stroke of invention to manifest the two components required by the three-body solution. Sophia's absorption in the challenge she faces is total, and then suddenly, a violent commotion erupts from the direction of the Archons. Until now, the floater has not caused concern for Sophia. It has drifted mite-like within the vast enclosure of the harbour zone. Without a fixed orbit, they thrash around in a random way, like fly in a bottle. But the ruse persists. Occupied with erecting the satin-scented platform in imitation of the beauteous designs of the Pleroma, the Archons have posed no problem, not even a slight distraction. But now something is going wrong in the clockwork mechanism. 
Alert to the new development, Sophia observes the stereoma juddering and coming apart. The mechanical simulation does not possess the divine properties inherent to pleuromic harmony, the living fractality of super life. The dynamics of the stereoma lack innate integrity. The central body, Saturn, cannot maintain the orbital load. The six planets are detaching from their orbits and the entire construction is on the verge of shattering. The Archons flee their collapsing world en masse. Furious at the loss of their hive nest, they rampage across the harbour zone in black tsunamis emitting a horrific peal of metallic screeching. Like a plague of locusts, they number in billions upon billions, having multiplied in their habitat. With the increase of numbers, their behaviour has grown aggressive. Yet again, Sophia faces the threat of the unintended side effect of her plunge from the galactic core. How can she restrain and confine the aberrant species, or why not simply annihilate it? She could resort to that action and perhaps achieve it, but having produced the Archon Horde, Sophia is bound by conscience to take responsibility for it. Cosmic abortion it may be, but it is her abortion. The collapsing habitat is not entirely destroyed, however. Saturn remains intact, and there is planetary debris that could be salvaged for another platform, another version of the stereoma. In her growing knowledge about the dynamics of space, time, and matter in the Kenema, Sophia sees why the force field of Saturn was insufficient to sustain the archontic planetary system. Saturn is not a star. Only stars can provide the dwell point for the machinery of orbiting planets. With this insight, the wisdom goddess sees a solution immediately at hand. The solar mass of Savitri provides what Saturn could not. Sophia signals her intention to the orbiting star so that they merge forces and establish a trough in the Dema. The electrical field polarised between them forms a closed circuit. Together they draw Saturn into the tro. Savitri captures it and swings it into an orbital track. Tremendous electrical discharges surge across the harbour zone. Blue-white lightning and thunderous eruptions explode over a raging sea. The planetary debris pours into the trough and collects symmetrically like iron filings. Then Savitri slides majestically into a commanding position and pinches the circuit. These actions configure the cosmic rubble into the scaffolding of another planetary system. To stabilize the assembly, Sophia adds gyroscopic plates, the super thin rings of Saturn. She restores the hexagonal dynamic of the stereoma and makes it integral with the ring structure. The hexagon of Saturn is the landmark for the archons, showing them where to alight. Automatically, they flock to it en masse. They furiously resume hive activity to replace the habitat that collapsed. As before, their construction replicates the living geometry of the Pleroma in lifeless mechanics. The harbour zone is again serene. Within it floats a six-planet, sun-centred system with Saturn defining the boundary, the second stereoma. The new habitat is a triumph for Sophia in her challenge to master the strange physics of the Kenema. Savitri holds it on a steady course along the inner wall of her serpent ring. This time, the platform has integral poise and power supplied by the central sun. And it has something else as well, an attribute absent in the previous construction, radar emission. This energy catches Sophia's attention and strikes a warning note. She turns her attention to close observation of the phenomenon. What she discovers now is totally astonishing. 
Viewed at close range, the sun-centered platform displays properties unique to the Kenema that support the archons. That would make sense, for they are composed of raw material of the Dema. Sophia detects how the new habitat offers them conditions to mutate. The aborted fetus that emerged from the fractal seahorse waves is no longer a stunted larva. It now comes to resemble the body plan of the anthropos, but prematurely born, oversized head, bug eyes, emaciated torso, and long spindly limbs. The mutation is a grotesque parody of the newborn human as it would appear in the favorable habitat of a planetary laboratory. But this quasi-human insect is inorganic, a cyborg. It does not even breathe. Sophia's concentration now is extremely intense, and she observes the mutation process. It gets stranger and stranger. Lo and behold, the mutation produces a second form, having the shape of a lizard and the attitude of a lion, roaring, boastful, arrogant. Sophia beholds it seated on the hexagon of Saturn, taken for its throne. The monster focuses the radar emission into a needle-sharp beam that sweeps around in a great circle. It lacks the organs of a living creature, yet the monster sees with the scanning beam. It sees, though it is blind. The range of the scanning beam falls far short of galactic dimensions. It only covers the space within the confines of the harbour zone, enclosed by the immense reef of Sophia's aeonic luminosity. The reptilian archon is blind to the divine light surrounding it, but its blindness endows it with uncanny power. How can this be so? Sophia wonders. Is there an inversion of intelligence operating here? Suddenly the star goddess comprehends. The reptilian entity supplies the mindless archon horde with something like an ego, the basis for a self-image. It confers a false authority, and with that, the will to dominate, to rule. The instant this insight comes to Sophia, the entity erupts. It declares itself to be the ruler of all it beholds, and since there is nothing else to see, it declares that it must be the only God in the universe, the sole and supreme creator. A momentous realization jolts the wisdom goddess. Emerald hues and starbursts of diamond brilliance flash in her coils. For the first time since her plunge, she knows in perfect and total clarity what she could not know in the Pleroma. The realization is unique to herself, novel and incomparable. Even the aeons in the Pleroma, skilled in infinite inventiveness and boundless in their wisdom, do not know it and cannot know it as she can, situated where she is. And Sophia glories in what she alone knows. The cosmic intention of the aeons is autopoetic self-generating, but the activity of the archons is mimetic. It can only replicate, not create. Mimesis is not intention. It merely replicates something intended by another agency. The stereoma is at origin a copycat world. It could never have appeared had Sophia not lent to the archons a spark of noose, divine intelligence, and likewise had she not revealed to them the super-living designs of the Paroma, there would be no clockwork cosmos for them to inhabit. The second stereoma is a copy of a copy. That double duplication reveals to Sophia an original truth known to herself alone. Her insight goes to the source of the alien mutation. One copy replicates the other so that, between the two, Depth appears. The depth adds an inwardness where self-awareness can arise. It gives the archons a reflection of their hive mind equivalent to a self-image. That image emerges in this entity, the dracon. 
the reptilian overlord of the hive mind. This is the archontic ego deity, the Demiurge. With Saturn for his throne, the Dracon oversees the dark space within the confines of Sophia's serpent ring, taking it for all that exists. It grows ever more arrogant, more inflated by a false sense of power. Its arrogance attracts and fuels the aggression of his minions, the neonate archons. Their rapacious fury rises to a crescendo. The radar beam splits and multiplies by replication, splitting again and again. The result is a massive configuration of the energy of the hive mind. The stereoma becomes the epicenter of escalating frequencies that mirror the reptilian mind. From the summit of Saturn, the alien god exercises its authority. These events darken the mood of the wisdom goddess. A terrible intimation sends bands of crimson and cold electric blue shivering through her coils. The course of events is clear to her. Based on an illusion though it is, the arrogant authority of the Dracon will increase. For illusion knows no bounds. It cannot be contained, only eradicated. As an aeon, Sophia knows this to be true. Now she must suffer the terrible truth about the Dracon. It will not remain in the place where it arises. It will not respect the boundaries given to it. The reptilian intelligence is invasive. Wherever it directs the Archons, they are bound to swarm mindlessly and destroy all natural order, ravage the beauty and balance of organic existence and attack the symbiotic web of life. Sophia is deeply troubled, not only by the increasing power of this invasive species, but more so by the threat it might pose to the Anthropos. The Orion Nebula hovers at close range, suspended beneath the flat plane of the galactic limb. Its position is offset in intergalactic space, if only by a slight angle. Circling on the edge of the galactic limb, Sophia's serpent ring abides at her impact zone, the terminus of the long plume that erupted upon her plunge from the pleroma. The ring encloses the stereoma, but the orbit of Savitri periodically brings the archontic platform close to the nebula. The danger of this arrangement is clear. Nine strains of the Anthropos genome have streamed from M42. Plasmic filaments carried the propagules to planetary worlds favourable to their emergence. From the Pleroma, Sophia observed the nine divine experiments that resulted from the seeding of her designer species. Now there is an imminent danger for the tenth strain, the Anthropos, to come. The Archons can break loose and go on a rampage. If circumstances run beyond her control, Sophia would have to witness that event. The mere chance of it fills her with anger. Humanity would suffer due to her mistake. The transgression of the pleuromic boundary that she committed now risks a worse eventuality. She realises that the archontic overlord will not observe the boundaries of the stereoma. What if the archon swarm were to descend upon the habitat of Anthropos 10? Sophia's anger flares to a breaking point. Although she presently sees no way to ward off such a catastrophe, something like a maternal instinct compels a response from the depths of her aeonic power. She resolves to protect the next strain of the Anthropos, and all she can do toward that end is perform an act of divine defiance. The full force of her pranoia now goes directly to the Dracon, the blind god, Saklas. The aeonic pronouncement sounds across the galaxy all the way to the Pleroma. You are mistaken, Saklas, blind god that you are, for you are only a pretending god, falsely inflated by the illusion of power. The authority you claim by your arrogance depends on deceit 
and when deceit fails, you perish. There is a deathless child of light who came into existence before you and who will stand against your phantasms. That luminous child will trample you in contempt. It will reduce you as a potter's clay is pounded down, and you will descend to your origin in the abyss along with all your legions. For at the consummation of your works, the defect that obscures the true source of all that exists will be abolished, and the defective cosmos will cease to be as it is, and it will be as if it never was. Expansion Throughout her adventure, the wisdom goddess discovers and learns. The Gnostic aeons do not conform to the conventional concept of God, defined as a supreme being who is all-knowing and all-powerful. They are, like all creatures in the natural world, not exempt from discovering and learning in the course of their experiences. Being more alive, supernaturally amplified, they attain realizations on a scale of amplification inconceivable to the human mind. Nevertheless, human intelligence is a product of aeonic intelligence, and so it can to some extent reach toward what the gods experience. It does so using the same conceptual language humans apply to describe their own behavior. The description is provisional, framed in terms specific to the human world, but it does not categorically exclude comprehension of the divine world, the supernatural. That comprehension is infinitely minute, surely, but it is not trivial. Correctly developed, it is not delusional either. As above, so below. The locale of the fallen goddess scenario is the third limb of the local spiral galaxy in close proximity to the constellation of Orion the Hunter. Naked eye observation shows that the composite of Orion hangs off the plane of the galactic limb. Likewise, M42, the Orion Nebula, is slightly offside below. Otherwise, it would be much harder to see. Sophia's impact zone may be imagined placed at the edge of the limb, above the figure of Orion. When the star goddess recovers from the impact, she forms her torrential body into a closed circle, the Euroboros. This is the harbour zone where Savitri arrives and eventually provides the central star for the Stereoma, the Archontic Planetary System. Customizing a planet for a pre-designed species is a speciality of aeonic invention exclusive to the more mature, highly practiced aeons. It could be called aeonic terraforming. Terra, any hospitable planetary habitat. Species originate in the Peroma as genomic plasms. No planet can originate in the galactic core or exist there. Planets appear in the galactic arms, in one case due to the perpetual grind of the millstone of the Kenema. The mills of the gods grind slow, but they grind exceeding fine, an old saying goes. They arise spontaneously in conformity with the physics of the Kenema. In the second case, kenomic material can be terraformed by activity directed from the Peroma. The purpose of that activity would be to place a specific genome in a specific predetermined environment. Planets are laboratories for divine experiments conducted by the aeons. Terraforming is interesting from one viewpoint because it sets up an experiment in which a species emerges in the environment deliberately matched to its makeup. Interesting from another viewpoint, perhaps more interesting, is the case of a planetary setting that offers conditions favorable to a species, but not precisely matched to it. That is the case of planets that arise spontaneously in the Kenema with aeonic preparation. 
Sophia is bound by conscience, or the aeonic equivalent, whatever that is. Attributing this human factor to the star goddess is not mere fantasy. As noted above, the only way to comprehend superhuman, superliving forces is by reference to human experience. Because all that lives on the human scale is an outcome and expression of life on the cosmic scale, the comparison is not delusional, but it has to be handled carefully. Gnostic cosmologies on the origin of the world, NHC, indicate explicitly that the archontic world system collapsed, but without elaboration on how or why it did so. That being so, a second system had to be constructed. No clear elaboration on that either, but it appears to fit what scholars call the conversion of Sabaoth. That is the event of coupling or alignment between Sophia and a star called, in an earlier episode, Savitri, a renaming of Sabaoth. In current scientific debate, the heretics of EU plasma cosmology, Thunderbolt's project, emphatically assert a previous formation of the solar system as a columnar alignment with Saturn at the apex. This polar arrangement, as it may be called, might be regarded as a trope that alludes to the first stereoma in which Saturn was the dominant body holding the other planets in alignment. Depth The dimension given by a copy of a copy of something original. Sophia's insight about how the archontic hive can produce an overruling entity is extremely subtle and far-reaching. Imagine a beehive in which the drones produce the queen. In archontic mimesis, this happens in an aberrant, unnatural way. It does not introduce true inwardness, for the archons lack the original consciousness required for self-reflection and autonomy. Nevertheless, they attain a semblance of it in this way. In the repeated replication of copies, a document or IT program, for example, each copy diverges from the original and appears to stand by itself. In the absence of the original, the copies replicate it, though none of them can be original. Just so, IT and AI, wrongly called artificial intelligence, can only replicate what is original, never replace it. Carried forward to today, Sophia's brilliant insight applies to robotic and electronic mechanisms, the tools of informational technology. It asserts that such tools can never surpass or replace the human mental capacities that originate them. This is but one of the far-reaching implications of her insight. Archontic mutation is stated, but not fully elaborated, in Gnostic writings. The aberrant species exhibits two body types, the neonate, or grey, ET, and the draconic type. Note, the draconotrope goes to the reptilian form, not serpentine form. Snakes are reptiles, but distinct from lizards, alligators, healer monsters, and other draconic creatures. Needless to say, it is remarkable, if not astonishing, that Gnostic intel of millennial age presents an exact description of the two most well-known types of alien ETs suspected of meddling in human affairs. Archontic mutation described in the Fallen Goddess scenario exhibits three stages. First mutation. At 2.4 billion iterations of the Mandelbrot set, the larval form emerges from the inert frozen seahorse waves of the impact zone. It mimics the shape of the human embryo in gestation. Also, the draconic head gains initial definition within the fractal maze. It appears to bite or seize the larval entity at mid-torso. Second mutation. 
the Huhe, the aborted fetus, mutates into the grey ET, the archontic drone resembling a prematurely born human. Third mutation. The reptilian entity emerges as overlord of the hive mind. Fractal iteration reveals its germinal form in the aggressive dragon head with serpent tail. It attaches itself to the larval torso as noted. The alien drones, as they may be called, locate the directing force of the hive mind in that entity. The dracon is their virtual self-image. It can be said that the drones manifest the dracon so that it can command them in actions they could not perform on their own. As the drones are also clones, nothing but replicas of each other, the archontic overlord can be called the Lord of the Clones. Sophia's rebuke to the Dracon is something like a prophetic proclamation, rare in Gnostic writings, unique in fact. Better said, perhaps, it is a frontal threat display. This act of defiance plays ahead in the home story all the way to the current moment when the entire world faces the consummation of the work of the Archons. The use of the word cosmos in this context is qualified by a critical nuance. Gnostics distinguished the earth, Coptic, kaz, K-A-Z, derived from the Greek gay or Gaia, from cosmos, as spelled in Greek. They regarded earth as a unique domain set apart from the cosmos, a word with negative and derogatory connotations in Gnostic teachings. Cosmos is a trope that goes to the agenda, order out of chaos. Literally, cosmos means order arrangement, understood with a positive spin. But the correct translation of cosmos, as Gnostics used it, is system with a negative spin. A system is something artificial and contrived, systemic racism for example. The more exact translation would be the system. The outcome of the divine experiment with the Anthropos on this planet depends on the true children of the earth overcoming the system of the Archons. Those are the children Sophia invokes in the expressions deathless child of light and that luminous child. They are the offspring of the Aeonic Mother, originating by design from the Pleroma. The Archons are offspring produced unintentionally from the Kenema. Summary Episode 7 is a scenario of dramatic developments that impact the Aeon Sophia in her pre-terrestrial state and carry forward to impact the habitat she provides for the Anthropos when she turns into the Earth in the following episode of the Fallen Goddess scenario. Her confrontation with the Dracon is unique in all surviving Gnostic source materials. Quote, When the Aeon Sophia saw the impiety of the chief ruler, she was filled with anger. She was invisible. She said, you are mistaken, Samael. There is an immortal man of light who has been in existence before you and who will appear among your modelled forms. He will trample you to scorn, just as a potter's clay is pounded, and you will descend to your mother, the abyss, along with those that belong to you. For at the consummation of your works, the entire defect that has become visible out of the truth will be abolished, and it will cease to be as it is and will be like what has never been. End quote. This momentous passage is inscribed today in the hearts and minds of those who know the home story and choose to live their lives transpersonally, guided by the sacred narrative the biography of the Divine Mother.
The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 8, The Passage Toward Orion The outburst of defiance against the Archon Overlord leaves Sophia unsettled. The confidence she holds in her designer species is imperative, but it raises a troubling question. Can the Anthropos overcome the Archons, given that it was not designed to meet that challenge in the first place? In calibrating the human genome, she and Thelete made no provision for such a danger. The chance that humanity in some strain or another might come under attack from an alien non-human species as pernicious as the Archons did not factor in the original genomic plan. They had endowed the Anthropos with a skill set for predation, indeed a high dose of hunting and killing ability but not the skills required to handle a predator of this specific kind. Once again, Sophia's attention goes to her highest priority, the next emergent strain of the human genome, the Anthropos to come, A10, is imminent. At any moment, a plasmic current in the Orion Nebula might capture a cluster of propagules and carry it into the galactic arms. There, it would eventually seed in a hospitable environment provided by a planet. Another divine experiment would begin. Sophia is now more determined than ever to provide the optimal setting for A-10. It must be a safe haven, a planetary arc, where it has free range to achieve its genius potential. The three-body system she dreamed in the Paroma offers that habitat but how to accomplish it is still uncertain. For now, the stereoma is confined to the harbour zone, and the dracon detects nothing beyond it. Fortunately, Savitri has secured the dwell point of the Archontic planetary system. The stereoma cannot escape the capture of that massive solar body. The floater goes where the sun takes it, round after round, it circulates the inner perimeter of the harbour zone. Sophia pictures the three-body setting at a safe distance from the Dracon and its swarm of rapacious drones. But if it is not to appear within the sheltering reef of her body, where can it appear? Somewhere else in the galactic arms or somewhere beyond it out in intergalactic space? Suddenly, Sophia sees a way to achieve her highest aim. If she entrains another star from M42, as she did with Savitri, she would have the first component of the three-body planetary system. The young Aeon is a fast learner. By coupling with another newborn star, she can repeat what she achieved with Savitri, aggregation of planetary matter along the channel of a bipolar circuit and do it better this time by using her pronoia to limit the aggregation to one planet and its satellite. Clearly, the best locale for the system would be close to Orion. The entire constellation is offside, detached from the dense star population in the local arm. M42 floats in intergalactic space, the outer zone. Savitri came to Sophia from there and ascended majestically to the thin plane of the galactic arm, the Milky Way. The task ahead requires that Sophia takes passage toward Orion to rendezvous with a nascent star. This plan looks clear and achievable to the Wisdom Goddess, but it comes with a dilemma. She cannot execute the plan as long as her body forms the serpentine reef around the harbour zone. Yet it keeps the stereoma confined and the archons at bay. To dissolve it would risk setting them loose across the range of the galactic limb. The arrogance of the dracon would eventually drive the archons to trespass the boundaries of their habitat and to go on the rampage. Sophia cannot abandon the harbour zone but she cannot depart to Orion unless she does just that. How can she stay located in the galactic limb 
and move away from it at the same time. The dilemma arouses Sophia to a moment of deep self-knowing. Whatever it takes to produce a home planet for the Anthropos is still to be discovered. That is an unknown that lies beyond the reach of her powers so far. But how can she meet that challenge if she does not test her aeonic skills to the utmost? The audacity that compelled her plunge from the galactic core comes again to the fore. It sets her on course for another cosmic dare. So fire resolves to apply the supreme skill that does lie within the reach of her aeonic powers, mitosis. To move out of the galactic arm and leave the harbour zone intact, Sophia must split into two organisms. The immense cell of her reposing body has to divide into two daughter cells. One daughter cell stays where it is and keeps the harbour zone intact, while the other is free to venture into the outer zone. That is the only way she can undertake the passage toward Orion. Intergalactic space is an unknown terrain to Sophia. Her plunge from the Pleroma took her laterally across the plane of the galactic arms, but still keeping within it. Now she intends to drop steeply below it. The plummet requires that she reshape the daughter cell into a projectile, a serpentine form. That form is of course familiar to her as an aeon, but the shape she now assumes must be streamlined for optimal control. A sperm-like body with an oval head attached to a thread-like tail. It is the shape best suited for spiralling down into the outer zone. This precipitous action demands the fullest exertion of the screw-drive propulsion in her coils. Decontraction of the coils will release the enormous torque needed for escape velocity from the galactic plane, and that terrific torque will propel her into the outer zone straight toward M42. With total concentration, Sophia morphs into the dive formation for the plunge, but something goes instantly wrong. The full decontraction of her coils provides ample thrust, but holding direction is impossible. In a flash of panic, Sophia realises that she cannot steer her powers as she intends. The trajectory of release from the galactic plane immediately runs out of control. Never having ventured into the outer zone, she does not know that the field magnetism out there is different, far stronger than in the galactic plane. The living electrical surge of her aeonic currents encounters impedance and damping. In this unknown terrain, she loses autonomy and she descends. Her spermatic body swerves wildly across the magnetic medium of intergalactic space. The coherence of her coils falters and they begin to splay and unravel. But the torque released by decontraction does not falter. It drives her straight toward M42 at full acceleration. There is no way to break the trajectory. Sophia is heading on a crash course for M42. If she does not stop or steer away, she will plunge into it and blast the precious template to shreds. Sophia shudders from a shockwave of excruciating contortion. The physics of the outer zone is strange and overwhelming. It tangles the spermatic tail and flattens the head bulge, causing it to sprout wings like grotesque ears. Sophia's disorientation is extreme, but she still has the presence of mind to see the one thing she can do to avert crashing into M42. There is no option but to recontract her coils. The effort demands the last measure of her strength, but it works. Almost instantly, the acceleration breaks, but in reaction, the entirety of her elongated body compresses down to a knot. She is in a stall 
locked into the magnetic medium of the outer zone like a butterfly pierced by a pin. The shock of paralysis is all-consuming. But the stall does not continue. Her coils rebound and send her careening in reverse back to the high density of the galactic plane. This trajectory takes a wide curve grazing the body of Orion. Once again, Sophia finds herself veering precariously close to the nebula. Far too close this time and unable to pull away, she rips along the border of the immense webwork that holds the template in suspension. Like a veil of silk torn by a violent wind, the template shreds along its edge into ragged streamers that instantly funnel into the slipstream of her torrent. And Sophia carries the torn away threads of the sheared template in her straggling body as she surges madly upward to the galactic plane. Drawn by the power of attraction to her other half, she regains the harbour zone. The density of the kenoma is almost welcoming, a plush cushion. When Sophia reaches the interior of the daughter cell she left behind, her inner forces of cohesion are close to exhaustion. The spermatic form she assumed is striated and slack. Lacking the supple strength to flex itself, the tail drifts sinuously this way and that. She barely manages to navigate using the awkward wingtip deformations on her head. It takes all her concentration to pull around towards Savitri. The passage in the outer zone magnetized her vital substance and depleted its innate electrical charges. The magnetic aura of the sun draws strongly upon her languid forces. Her spermatic body slithers uncertainly across the harbour zone. The presence of Savitri steadies Sophia's erratic drift, as if she is calling the depleted Aeon to refuge. But where Savitri is, so is the stereoma. The approach to the solar body takes Sophia on a direct path to the cosmic carousel of the Archons. Her extreme exertions in the outer zone have left Sophia dazed. All that she sees and feels begins to resemble a slow-motion dream. The multi-geared clockwork of the stereoma looms ahead of her, the golden egg of Savitri glowing serenely at its core. To reach that amiable star and couple her power to it once again is the only goal within her range now. The layered orbits of the Archontic platform grind on tilting axes with hypnotic regularity. The armillary sphere of the planetary cosmos is a vast cage of interlocking rings and spinning globes. It looms larger and larger as Sophia approaches its outer limit, the orbit of Saturn. She is now a long wisp of tangled white vapour wending its way into an immense, dark, spherical maze. A whispering hush comes over the Archontic Matrix as the Dracon observes the entrance of the Star Goddess. The Locust Horde attends in mute fascination. The impact of the alien world of the Archons is gradual and insidious. What happens now affects Sophia in ways she cannot know and will not know until later when she faces the result of that impact. She is like the subject of hypnosis who forgets being in a trance and only later enacts the commands of the hypnotist. The passage inward towards Savitri subjects her primary aeonic substance to adulteration, the permeation of super-living luminosity by inorganic chemistry. It happens in stages as she transits the ambient zones of each planet, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Tiamat. All she can sense is the uncanny impression of colours flushing through her coils. The wash of colours stains her primary luminosity with distinct tints, spectroscopic bands, 
Exposure to the planetary fields of the Archon cosmos is loading her body with metallic elements, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganate, iron, nickel, cobalt, copper, lead, each conferring a colour, a distinct tint. The chemical load weighs on the buoyancy of her primary substance body, organic light. The post-hypnotic trance deepens. Passing Mars, Sophia receives an electrical boost from Savitri. Once again, they lock into a circuit and merge forces. Miraculously, the connection insulates Sophia from the ambient zone behind her. The dynamic bond between Aeon and Star generates a tremendous blast causing the entire mechanism of the stereoma to shiver and quake. Electrical discharges erupt in pulsing waves that leap from planet to planet and race around the slanting planes of the platform. Blue sheet lightning tangled with ornate silver veins flash across the entire system. Electrochemical eruptions scar the outer planets. Enormous gas clouds loaded with alkali metals, magnesium, strontium, barium, chlorine, erupt and roll like tumbleweeds across the vast reaches of the orbital planes. Amidst the chaos, Savitri and Sophia consolidate their fields with hydrogen and ozone bonds. They carve a furrow to gather the raw material of the daima and aggregate it into spheres. The torrid worlds of Venus and Mercury materialize in the solar vortex between Sophia and the Sun. As the spin of the vortex pulls them into high-velocity orbits, it pulls on Sophia as well. But there is no orbit for her to follow, and anyway, she is not a planetary body, not yet. Tremendous circular momentum is mounting in the solar vortex. A shock wave of compression hits Sophia's spermatic body. The thin, straggling tail contracts into the head and produces a spinning ball. Her body now resembles a gaseous comet that has swallowed its own tail. The tremendous currents circulating in the vortex pull it toward revolution, but Savitri guides the process of orbital capture. Sophia responds by summoning her pranoia in a final feat of autonomy. Something in her knows that the dream of a three-body world is about to come true. One thing at least is certain. Savitri is there to provide the balance and centering she cannot attain on her own. But she cannot escape the large-scale capture of the stereoma. In that hostile setting, she will establish the habitat for A10, whatever it takes. The time for merely dreaming the existence of that unique home planet comes to an end. And so she chooses to turn into it. Orbital momentum is now all-consuming. Sophia's body condenses as she spins, searching for traction. She finds it at the rim of the solar vortex between Venus and Mars, but instantly the traction slips. The overwhelming orbital thrust is still too intense. It generates a slingshot effect that spins her on a careening arc outward. She crosses the orbit of Mars and collides head-on with Tiamat, strewing a turbulent stream of debris along its orbital path. The impact steadies Sophia for just long enough to find her bearings. She curves around on a wide arc, heading back toward the sun. This time, she regains the traction that faltered before. She settles into the orbital track running between Venus and Mars. The compression of Sophia's aeonic substance intensifies to its extreme. As she morphs into planetary form, all the foreign material absorbed in transit through the stereoma solidifies. The tints of adulteration in her coils do not remain mere colours. They thicken into coatings on the surface of the emergent planet. 
Vapor fumes loaded with ozone, fluorine, methane, and nitrogen envelop it with interweaving veils. All but one part of the star goddess has turned into solid mass. Knowing that she will need to remember herself as she originally was, Sophia holds back one last pure gleam of aeonic radiance. The act of becoming Earth shall not deliver her to total oblivion. But how will she behold her original self in the obscurity of material imminence? What will give her the reassuring reflection of organic light? What solace will she have on this journey as a planetary arc? The wisdom goddess reaches the completion of her cosmic dare only then, exactly then. It comes at the moment she exudes the last pure gleam, shedding one teardrop in the sky, an omen, a nomen, an ornament of gleaming pearl, the moon. Expansion The location of Sophia's impact in the third galactic arm is visible to the naked eye of observers on Earth. The star delta in the constellation of the stork, conventionally designated as Monoceros, marks the exact spot. Most of the stars composing it are placed within the borders of the Milky Way, but two stars, Beta and Zeta, extend into intergalactic space. These stars mark the head, eye, and beak of the stalk. They define a line of sight that goes directly to M42, the Orion Nebula. These are exact details of the composite of the constellation, the group of stars included in it. The shape of the constellation clearly has the posture of a diving bird. The motion and structure of the spiral arms depend on forces unique to intragalactic space, that is, the space populated by the stars, nebulae, globular clusters that define the shape of those arms. All galaxies float in the medium of intergalactic space, outer space, on the galactic scale. Each island universe, as galaxies were originally called at the time of Hubble's discoveries in the 1930s, floats in a vast sea of intergalactic space where star population is reduced. The conditions in the space between galaxies are different from those operating in the arms and different again from the dynamics of the core. The Orion constellation is located in intergalactic space below the third galactic arm. Sophia's primary substance body is a torrent of living luminosity capable of feeling, perception, reflection, and intention. Plasma is an electrically charged vapor with the attributes of a living creature. The natural activity of plasma is to flow, either in wide streams, veil nebula, or in filaments. It is a filamentary weave but the weave can also bunch or gather. The coils of Sophia's plasmic torrent are gatherings of this type. The term spermatic form refers to the comet-like shape given to the daughter cell that allows Sophia to dive into the intergalactic space outside the galactic arm where she landed. Due to the stress of the outer zone, it deforms and splays her shape. The result is a tangled, dissipating tail compensated by an enlarged head with wing-like or ear-like extensions. The events of the fallen goddess scenario can to some extent be described by allusion to astrophysics and the assumed laws of electromagnetism. But there is yet no paradigm adequate for rendering the Sophianic myth in clear scientific language. Sophia's venture into the interior of the stereoma echoes to an ancient motif of the mystery schools, the journey through the planetary spheres. Summary Episode 8 describes the terrification of the Aeon Sophia 
that is, the process of morphing into a planet. According to Gnostic cosmology, the Earth is an organic planet captured in an inorganic system. The Fallen Goddess scenario shows that the Earth does not arise in the same way as the other planets in the solar system. It also shows that the Earth belongs to a three-body system comprised of a star, a planet, and its satellite, the Moon. Gaia Sophia is in totality that three-body system, not exclusively the terrestrial body. Thus, Sophia eventually turns into what she dreamed in the Pleroma. Her body becomes the setting for a divine experiment with the Anthropos. Gnostic writings indicate the cosmological precedent for the Sun-Earth-Moon system in a text entitled Trimorphic Protonoia from the NHC. Literally, the three-formed divine first thought. Episode 8 also describes the shearing of the anthropic template. This event is to have far-reaching consequences for the human species. The gender rift is a theme in world mythology, more commonly known as the division of the sexes. The Fallen Goddess Scenario in Nine Episodes Episode 9, This Divine Experiment The Aeon Sophia awoke at the beach only to realise that she was the beach, and the beach was everywhere that ocean waves licked the contours of her dream body, the earth. There was not any substance to be detected, not at first, not even a fluid mass, not even vapour, only a flutter stirred to life, the first glimmer of self-awareness, as if the flutter of the eyelashes of someone sleeping awakened the sleeper from a dream. But Sophia did not awaken from the planetary dream. The earth was there due to the act of the Aeon dreaming it. The perilous journey through the planetary spheres had induced momentous changes in the power of divine imagination innate to the aeons. Sophia had applied that power in the technique of the older aeons. First came the intent, enoia, and then its expression through pronoia, the instrument for manifesting what is intended. With Thelate, she had intended the design of the Anthropos, and together they materialized the genomic plasm of the template the aggregate of encoded noose. That was the divine creative act accomplished in the Pleroma. But the unattended consequences of planetary embodiment profoundly altered those divine powers. Sophia found herself in a situation that was the result of her intent. She had never before experienced the result of her intent upon herself. Now morphed into the earth, she could only apply aeonic imagination to uphold what happened to her, to shape what she had become. She could not intend to control or change it in any external way. She had to work through deep immersion, entirely from within the immense vitality of the planet. To be captured in material imminence was a thrill, but it bound the star goddess to the necessity of continuing to dream. From now on, her life as an Aeon would be utterly different from her previous life in the Pleroma. It would unfold by spontaneous elaboration of that unique product of dreaming projection, the Earth. To do otherwise would recklessly undo what she had become. And what had Sophia become? There was no way to know the opportunities of this vast new world without exploring them moment by moment. She was like a newborn child that must discover the world spontaneously as its senses and faculties mature. Her life as the earth was to be an ongoing adventure of self-discovery. That process would eventually lead her to master the immense complexity of the biosphere. But the first flutter 
of self-awareness was almost devoid of mental presence. At first, there were only primitive sensations. Then came the slow dawning of raw emotions. Sophia knew how she felt before discerning what she felt. The passions of the wisdom goddess sustained the superorganism she was dreaming. Necessarily so, because the natural composition of that world was the direct conversion of the passions that turned her into it. This collection of Sophia's passions was the substance of the matter from which this world was formed. All other things owed their beginning to her terror and sorrow. For from her tears, all that is of a liquid nature was formed. From her smile, all that is lucent. And from her grief and perplexity, all the corporeal elements of the world. For at one time, she would weep and lament on account of being left alone in the midst of darkness and vacuity, while at another time, reflecting on the light which had forsaken her, she would be filled with joy and laugh. Then again, she would be struck with terror, or at other times would sink into consternation and bewilderment. From the tears of the enthymesis of the aeon, involved in passion, seas, and fountains, and rivers, and every liquid substance, derived its origin, that light burst forth from her smile, and that from her perplexity and consternation, the corporeal elements of the world had their formation. The body she now discovered was all water with a thin surface layer. The landmass was merely a coat of foam floating on a vast globular sea. Pangaea was her first skin, but the floating continents were so thin and porous that they quickly separated into huge jigsaw patches, tectonic plates. Whence all this water? She had drawn it from outer space. Her cometary body had sucked it up like a siphon. The oceanic body was a fusion of hydrogen and oxygen, but the oxygen was locked away. Sophia first breathed underwater like fish do, like the great whales sounding the depths. For many geons, she did not come up for breath. The Earth had no atmospheric membrane suitable to support life on land. Deep in the watery depths, Sophia played lavishly with exotic secretions. The deep sea alchemical elixirs of life included one agent of ferment that initially showed her the scope of her telluric powers, ethanol. It released the blue-green flush that freed the oxygen in one vast, ecstatic eruption of bliss. The taste of life came to her tongue when her taste buds coagulated in cyanobacteria. Everything is material. Blue-green algae erupted across the oceans when Sophia drew her first breath of earth-bound oxygen. When she exhaled, water spouts many times the height of Everest blew outwards in thousands of places at once. The cascades gathered into atmospheric vapour to form the ambient membrane where life forms would emerge. Massive vortices of spray collected at the poles of the spinning earth hovered, condensed, and dropped in rotating clouds that immediately froze. The polar ice caps brought presence of mind to the wisdom goddess. Their ice-cold whiteness was the semblance of her primary aeonic substance, organic light. Streaming glaciers adorned Sophia in an exquisite necklace of white lace. The next proof of mastery of her natural self came rapidly. She adjusted the oxygen to 21%, the exact ratio required for life to emerge and thrive. Now the water below and the oxygen above melded the floating foam of the continents into solid definition. The biosphere was a palette of living colours. Landscapes and biomes emerged like features of a painting conjured by the hand of the artist. The golden green of flora saturated the planetary decor. Once the stage for fauna was set, 
Sophia indulged in wild binges of animal dreaming. She commanded the genesis of life forms out of the ocean, first as undersea creatures, then as tubular plants that crawled to the land and mutated lavishly. Saltwater did not merely carry her aeonic memory, it was her memory. Every animal genome she had observed in the Pleroma was stored in the memorial depths of the ocean. Her dominant passion now was to remember those animations and dream them into existence. She reproduced the designs and improvised on them with endless ingenuity. From the womb of water, the Earth Mother brought forth the seeds of life. But there were strange consequences to her creative frenzy. To proliferate life forms in endless variety was easy, a natural talent. But to organize what she produced was a different kind of challenge. The genomic designs released in the ocean, in the sky, on land, presented such immeasurable diversity that turned out to be more than she could manage. With loving attention given to each specific creature of a species, Sophia could not nurture and guide the behavior of that species in unison. The sheer amplitude of autopoiesis overwhelmed her attention. To micromanage all the animations in her field of dreaming was impossible. The spectrum of life was rich and rampant, but it lacked coherence. Each species needed an additional factor to develop and thrive to its fullest. That factor was morphic unity. Sophia was on her own in a world of her own making, but not entirely. Since the moment of her plunge from the galactic core, the aeons in the Pleroma had observed the events overtaking her. Now, they detected a drawback due to her deficiency. It was not something she could resolve on her own, but if it were not resolved, the integrity of the natural world she had become would disintegrate into chaos. That risk compelled the Aeons to intervene. They did, after all, have a huge stake in this novel experiment. Sophia's world was an anomaly of supreme interest to them. It presented the unique case of a planetary laboratory, the setting for a divine experiment that involved the immediate presence of an Aeon. One of the Aeons who designed the genome for an experiment was now embodied in it. Sophia was indwelling the habitat where the Anthropos would emerge in its next strain, A10. This situation was entirely novel, indeed cosmically novel. The Aeons resolved a solution. It was an intervention that would not affect the essential conditions of Sophia's world, thus leaving her in freedom, but allow her to manage it to full efficiency. They assigned one Aeon, the Symbiont, to descend to the Earth and assist Sophia to organize her offspring into self-directing morphic fields. The Symbiont provided the exact skill needed for that adjustment. The intervention would confer on Sophia the extra measure required to arrange species in morphic fields rather than attend exhaustively to the specific animations which ran into trillions. The intervention of the symbiont imparted a figure to Sophia, but merely as respected substance, not so as to impart intelligence, but with respect to Sophia's intelligence, and brought healing to her passions, separating them from her, but not so as to drive them out of her mind altogether. This solution gave Sophia the skill to manage the full spectrum of species in the Earth dreaming. Upon accomplishing its mission, the symbiont withdrew from the Earth, but it left a radiant imprint in the atmosphere, like the afterimage of an object seen in bright light. It lingered as a numinous phantom. The presence of that phantom was to have tremendous impact on the emergent human races and continues to do so to this day. With morphic unity assured, Sophia's passion for animation was totally unhampered. 
photosynthesis triggered a rampage of innovation that raced through the entire biosphere. The Earth goddess exhausted every genomic design in her memory, then ramped up the process in excess. She produced species of her own invention for the sheer thrill of seeing them appear, confident they would play harmoniously in their morphic domains. Flocks of birds, herds of animals, schools of fish, exotic menageries of insects and reptiles all flowed like painted forms from the brush strokes of her first attention. Her delight in the living display of her dream body was endless. Everything she touched became more beautiful. In the mineral realm, the star goddess regaled her love of precision. Feldspar, mica, granite, basalt, sandstone, quartz, silver, and gold encased her most fervent wishes. Permanganate and nickel were among the deepest secrets she cherished. The rock formations arose from the land, molding the labor pains of her dream body. Mountain heights consoled her aching solitude. Volcanoes bore her sexual ache. Everything is material. The atmosphere was the high luxury that carried her moods. Clouds, mist, rain, snow, thunder and lightning composed the anima mundi, the soul of the world. Sophia made weather a constant replay of those compelling emotions that had turned her into the matrix of nature. Joy, terror, astonishment, grief, serenity, sorrow, outrage, and every shiver of divine bliss went directly into the skies, lightning striking at a thousand locales at once signalled the spillover of her synapsis. Tornadoes held her exasperation, the raging wind her ideation, waterfalls the scintillation of her pride. In storms over the seas, the Aeon, without a consort, vented throes of romantic anguish. In the calm seas, the exalted wonderment of self-beholding. She avenged her own fate in beauty that cannot be abated and never ends. And all this before one glance of human recognition. Gion upon Gion, the oceanic rumination of her dreaming, measured the sift of microbial emulsions. Hovering above the waters, the moon kept the tempo that guided all creatures great and small through cycles of birth, death, and rebirth. The opal streaming of its unique, non-adulterated light gave her a constant view of herself, a vanity mirror. It alone reflected her primary substance body, organic light. That immense pearl revealed her as she was in the pleroma, in the plenum of luminosity without shadow. And as the moon sailed across the heavens, it lit the panorama of the most sublime of all animations, the zodiac. There, in a rounded reef of coral, where the cosmic sea had withdrawn to leave the imprint of countless tides of aeonic dreaming, there, in the porous flesh of star-pointed animations, Sophia beheld the encircling remnant of her lost half, the daughter cell she formed before the passage toward Orion. What now attended the fallen star goddess in the world of her own making? Countless adventures and discoveries, for sure. But one event above all else, the coming of the Anthropos, its habitat was all prepared. The three-body world of Sophia's unilateral dreaming was ready to shelter the propagation of her designer species. That creature, and it alone, was to take the co-evolving factor in this divine experiment to its paramount expression, humanity, the self-electing agent of divine intention. When and how it would appear, the wisdom goddess could not determine or control, nor did she desire to do so. The foundation of the universe is loving freedom, that arrival was to be a free and spontaneous event. 
Meanwhile, the fallen goddess weaved a welcoming spell of enchantment through every feature and creature of the natural world. Beauty is supernatural. So the supernatural mother prepared the womb of beauty for that luminous child and awaited its coming with the infinite patience of an aeon. And then came the explosion. Expansion. The fallen goddess scenario is an aneric myth. It uses the metaphor of dreaming as an explanatory tool, but it does not dismiss the physical reality of the world as a mere dream, that is, as unreal, illusory, or unsubstantial. Consistent with this analogy, life in the universe can be defined as a recurrent dream. Specifically, life equates to the presence of living creatures experienced by the human animal as an ongoing movie, the world event, the world drama. Oneric myth is a unique genre of description with special advantages for clarity of participation in the world event. It accords closely with the paradigms of emanation and emergence. This way of framing reality is basic to any workable metaphysics. Also, in Hindu Tantra or paraphysics, the same idea is explicit. The world is called an imagination, Kalpana, for it is the creative ideation on the record memory of the past universe. This imagined world is totally, materially real. The dream body of the Aeon Sophia is the real and present Earth, no illusion involved. The assertion that Sophia is dreaming implies, of course, that the goddess is sleeping. True, but the sleep of a divine being is not like that of a human being. The aeonic power of dreaming is an active, productive state of material emanation. To say the aeon dreams is simply a way to describe that process of immediate emanation. The world event does not exist in a permanent state of factuality it is continually being emanated. That being so, the assertion that the Aeon sleeps is merely a notional device to point to the dreaming power. In actuality, Sophia dreams in a state of wakefulness relative to the reality of an Aeon, but the wakefulness that allows her to dream the world does not initially enable her to act in the world she dreams. Thus, the narrative specifies that she had never before experienced herself in a condition that was the result of her own dreaming. To quote from the Gospel of Philip from the NHC, the world system you inhabit came about through an anomaly. In this anomalous situation, the world mother eventually reaches the moment when she can go lucid in the world dream. This occurred around 1750. That event and the developments since it happened are covered in later episodes of the Fallen Goddess scenario, which expand beyond this version. Two eventualities may result from the sleeping, dreaming condition of the Aeon. To go lucid in the dream and to awake from the dream state. If Sophia awakes fully, from the world dream, it ends. Her intention is to persist in the state of lucid dreaming so that she can achieve her correction. Correction began after the reset event of March 2011 to March 2014. Summary The Fallen Goddess scenario sets the stage for the appearance of the human species on Earth. It describes the preceding conditions that came into effect before humanity, A10, emerged. Every detail of Sophia's trials and adventures before turning into the Earth has direct and immediate relevance to the human situation in the world drama today. Every detail.
The power of the home story is unique and unparalleled. It illustrates the fundamental assertion of Gnosis today, namely, the instruction of the three S's. First, the Aeon Sophia, or Divine Mother, is the designer-creator with Thelite of the human species. She is the source of humanity. Second, the Aeon Sophia is in material immanence, meaning in direct presence in the terrestrial habitat of the human species and all life, including in organic life. She is the setting of the world event and the human drama. Third, the narrative of the Aeon Sophia is the story to guide the species in its connection to all other than human animal life and the cosmic life of the Aeons. Her story is the guiding frame of human origin and purpose. No other mythic narrative produced by the human races in any age or culture can assert these claims and teach how to prove them. The path of proof is planetary tantra derived from the Terma of Gaia awakening on the 8th of August 2008. The most beautiful, bountiful and truthful story on earth is the story of the earth. Welcome to the mystical adventure of the Divine Mother. May you come to love and enjoy your divine birthright and learn to love yourself in the recognition of the powers that designed you and sustain you in every passing moment of the world drama. A kid thou hast fallen into milk.